Talmud, Masarak and ACHAPTER mission all persons are fit to evaluate or to be made the subjects of valuation are fit to bow another's worth or have their worth bowed priestly bites and ordinary Israelites women and slaves persons of unknown sex and hermaphrodites are fit to bow another's worth or to have their worth bowed and are fit to evaluate but they are not fit to be made the subjects of valuation for the subject of valuation may be only a person definitely either male or female a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor are fit to have their worth bowed or be made the subject of valuation but they are not fit to make either a bow of another's worth or to evaluate because they have no mind tomorrow what does all persons are fit to evaluate mean to include it is meant to include one close to manhood who must be examined what does all are fit to be made the subjects of valuation mean to include it is meant to include a person disfigured or one afflicted with Oils for one might have assumed that since scripture says of how according to the valuation that only such persons as are fit to be made the subjects of a vow as regards their worth are fit to be made subjects of evaluation and that persons who are unfit to be made subjects of a vow as regards their worth are also unfit to be made subjects of evaluation and scripture informs us of persons i.e. no matter who they be what does all persons are fit to bow mean to include the phrase all is needed only for the clause are fit to have their worth bowed what is to be included in the phrase all are fit to have their worth bowed is it to include persons of unknown sex or hermaphrodites but they are expressly stated in our mission again is it to include a deaf mute and imbecile and a minor they too are expressly stated and if it is to include a person below the age of one month that too is expressly mentioned and again if it is to include an idolater he too is expressly Mentioned in reality it is meant to include a person below the age of one month and the mission states it by implication and later on expressly mentions it what does all persons are obliged to lay on hands mean to include it is meant to include the ear and this against the view of our Judah what does all persons can affect a substitute mean to include that too means to include the ear in contrast to the view of our Judah for it was taught an ear must lay on hands and ear can affect a substitute our Judah says an ear does not lay on hands and an ear cannot affect a substitute what is the reason of our Judah's view scripture says his offering i.e. but not his father's offering and he infers the rule concerning the commencement of the dedication of the animal from the rule governing its end just as at the end of the dedication the ear does not lay on hands thus also at the beginning he cannot affect a substitute and the rabbi scripture says redundantly and if he shall add all change that included the ear and we infer the rule concerning the end of the dedication from the rule governing the commencement of the dedication just as at the beginning of the dedication the ear has power to effect a substitute so at the end is he obliged to lay his hands on the animal's head but what do the rabbis do with his offering they interpret his offering but not the offering of an idolater his offering but not the offering of his neighbor his offering i.e. to include all who have a share in the ownership of a sacrifice and the duty to lay on hands and our Judah he does not hold that all who have a share in the ownership share the obligation of laying hands thereon or indeed if he should hold so Talmud, Masarak and B he would infer the exclusion of idolater and neighbor from one passage so that two more would remain redundant from one of which he would infer that his offering means but not that of his father and from the other that all who have a share in the Ownership of a sacrifice are obliged to perform the laying on of hands, but what does our Judah do with if he shall at all change? He needs that to include woman, for it was taught since all this chapter is couched in masculine gender. What brings us eventually to include woman? The text stated if he shall at all change, but whence do the sages infer this from the redundant end of and our Judah? He does not interpret and if what does all persons are obliged to observe the laws concerning the booth mean to include that is meant to include a minor that no more needs his mother, for we have learned a minor that no more needs his mother is obliged to observe the laws concerning the booth. What does all are obliged to observe the law of the lulab mean to include that includes a minor who knows how to shake the lulab, for we learned a minor who knows how to shake the lulab is obliged to observe the laws of the lulab. What does all are obliged to observe the law of the fringes include? That includes a minor who knows how to wrap himself for it was taught a minor who knows how to wrap himself into the talit is obliged to observe the law of the fringes what does all are obliged to observe the rules concerning the tefillin include that includes a minor who knows how to take care of the tefillin for it was taught if a minor knows how to take care of the tefillin his father buys tefillin for him what does all are obliged to appear include it is meant to include one who is half slave and half freedman according however to Rabbana who holds that one who is half slave and half freed is free from the obligation to appear the word all is meant to include one who was lame on the first day of the festival and became normal again on the second day that would be right according to the view that all the days of the festival may make up for each other but according to the view that they all are but making up for the first day what will all come to include it will include one blind in one of his eyes this answer is not in accord with the following tana for it was taught Yohanan be Dahabai said in the name of Arjuna one blind in one eye is free from the obligation to appear for it is said yura yura he shall see he shall appear he just as he is present to see the comer so shall he be seen just as his sight is complete so shall the sight of him who appears be intact or if you like say this in truth it is meant to include one who is half slave and half freed man and if the view of Rabbana should appear as a difficulty this is no difficulty either the first view is in accord with the former mission of the second with the later mission for we learned one who is half slave and half freed man shall serve himself one day and his master the other thus Beth Hillel said Beth Shammai to them you took care of the interests of his master but you have done nothing thereby on his behalf for he is unable to marry either a female slave or free woman shall he do without marriage but the world was created only for propagation of the species as it is said he created it not a waste he formed it to be inhabited rather for the sake of the social welfare we force his master to set him free and the slave writes out a document of indebtedness covering the other half of his value Beth Hillel retracted and taught as Beth Shammai what does all are obliged to sound the shofar mean to include that includes a minor who has reached the age of training for we learned one does not prevent a minor from blowing the shofar on the festival all are obliged to read the scroll all are fit to read the scroll what are these meant to include Talmud, Masarak and they are meant to include women in accord with the view of our Joshua B. Levi for our Joshua B. Levi said women are obliged to read the scroll because they too had a part in that miracle what does all are obliged to arrange Simeon mean to include it means to include women and slaves for it was taught Women are under the obligation of Ximian amongst themselves and slaves are under the obligation of Ximian amongst themselves. What does all may be joined to Ximian mean to include that includes a minor who knows to whom one pronounces a blessing for our nom and said one may arrange Ximian with a minor who knows to whom one pronounces a blessing. What does all defile by reason of their flux include that includes a child one day old for it was taught it could have said when a man hath an issue out of his flesh. Why does the text state any man that is to include a child one day old teaching that he defiles by reason of his flux? This is the view of our Judah our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Barakah says this inference is not necessary for behold scripture reads and of them that have an issue whether it be a male or a female i.e. once he is a male however minor or major once she is a female whether minor or major if so why does the Torah use the redundant phrase any man the Torah? Speaks in the language of man what does all are susceptible to be defiled by someone defiled through contact with a corpse include that includes a minor for one might have assumed that since scripture reads but the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself that means only to a man does this law apply but not to a minor therefore it is said and upon the souls persons that were there what then did man come to exclude it is meant to exclude a minor from the penalty of excision. What does all contract uncleanness by leprosy include that includes a minor for one would have taught scripture reads a leprous man that means only a man but not a minor therefore we are taught that a minor too is defiled when leprous but say perhaps thus indeed the text reads when Adam a man shall have in the skin of his flesh i.e. as long as it is an Adam then why the word man this is in accord with what was taught a leprous man then I derive only the law is referring to a man. Whence am I to infer it for woman when it says and the leper that includes two why then does the text state a leprous man that refers to the matter referred to later is only a leprous man lets the hair of his head go loose and rents his clothes but a leprous woman does not let the hair of her head go loose nor does she rent her clothes what does all may inspect the signs of leprosy all are fit to inspect the signs of leprosy include that includes one who is not familiar with them and their
That includes slaves, but according to the one who teaches slaves explicitly, what does it include? That includes the case when a husband moves from a beautiful habitation in the diaspora into a bad one in the land of Israel. What does all may compel to go up to Jerusalem include? It includes the case of moving from a beautiful habitation into a bad one. All are obliged to observe the laws concerning the booth, even priests, levites, and Israelites, but that is self-evident for if they are not. Obliged who is obliged the statement is necessary for the priests for I would have thought since scripture says ye shall dwell in booths and the master said ye shall dwell means in the same manner as you occupy your habitation just as in the dwelling husband and wife are living together so shall husband and wife live together in the booth and since the priests are prevented by the temple service one would have assumed they are free from the obligation to dwell in the booth we are therefore taught that though they are free at the time of the service outside the time of the service they are definitely obliged to observe the laws of the booth just as is the case with travelers for a master has said those who travel by day are free from the obligation of the booth by day and are bound to it at night all are obliged to observe the law concerning the fringes even priests love and Israelites but that is self-evident it is necessary because of the priests for I would have thought since it is written, Thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff, thou shalt make the twisted cords, that only such persons as are bound by the prohibition of mingled stuff in their garments are obliged to make the twisted cords, as since to them the wearing of mingled stuff has been permitted, one might have thought that they would not be obliged to make themselves fringes. Therefore, we are informed that although that prohibition does not apply at the time of their service, it does apply outside that time of service. All are obliged to observe the commandment of the Tefillin, even priests, Levites, and Israelites, but that is self evident, it is necessary because of the priests, for I might have assumed that since it says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hands, and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes, that only those to whom the obligation to bind upon the hand applies are bound to bind upon the head, but as to the priests, the obligation of the sign upon the hand does. Not apply to them as it is written, and his linen garment, his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh, which means that nothing may intervene between them and his flesh. One might say the obligation of the sign upon the head similarly does not apply to them, therefore we are informed that they are not indispensable one to another, as we learned the tefillin of the arm is not indispensable to the tefillin of the head, neither is the tefillin of the head indispensable to the tefillin of the arm. But why shall it be different with the tefillin of the hand? Evidently, because scripture says, and his linen garments shall he put upon his flesh, but in connection with the sign upon the head, it is similarly written, and thou shalt set the mitre upon his head, it was taught between the plate and the mitre, his hair was visible at the place where he put his tefillin, all are obliged to perform the commandment touching the horn, even priests, love it, and Israelites, but that is self-evident for. The sake of the priest is it necessary for I might have assumed since it is written it is a day of blowing the horn unto you that only those who are obliged to sound the horn one day a year are obliged to do so on that day the priest however since they are obliged to sound the horn throughout the year as it is written ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings one might have assumed to be free from that obligation but these things are not similar here it is a case of the horn. There one of trumpets still the information is necessary for I might have assumed since we learned that the jubilee year is like the new year with regard to the sounding of the horn and the benedictions that therefore only he to whom the laws of the jubilee year apply is obliged to perform the laws touching the new year but he to whom the laws of the jubilee year do not apply need not perform the laws touching the new year and since priests are not affected by the laws governing the jubilee. Here as we learn priests and levites may sell at any time Talmud, Masarakane and Redeem at any time one might say that they are not affected by the laws governing the new year either therefore we are informed that although they are unaffected by the law of release of landed property the law concerning the release of debts and the emancipation of slaves binds them at any rate all are obliged to read the scroll even priests levites and Israelites is that not self-evident no it is necessary. To state that concerning the interruption of their temple service in accord with Rab Judah in the name of Rab for Rab Judah in the name of Rab said both the priests and their temple service the levites on their platform the Israelites at their posts interrupt their work and come to listen to the reading of the scroll all are obliged to arrange it Simeon even priests levites and Israelites is not that self-evident no it is necessary for the case in which the priests were eating consecrated. Foods I might have thought since the divine law said, and they shall eat those things wherewith atonement hath been made that this is an atonement, therefore we are informed the divine law has said, Thou shalt eat and be satisfied, and this applies to them as well. All may be joined for Eximian, even priests, Levites, and Israelites, is that not self evident? No, it is necessary for the case where the priests eat of terra or of consecrated foods, whilst the non priest eats of profane foods. I might have assumed that since the commoner, even though he desired to eat with the priest of the latter's food, he could not do so, therefore he could not be joined to him for the Eximian either. So we are informed that granted that the non priest may not eat together with the priest, the priest could surely eat together with the non priest. All may evaluate even priests, Levites, and Israelites, but that is self evident. Rabbi said, This is necessary in view of the opinion of Ben Bukri, for we learned our Judah. Said Ben Bukri testified at Jabna that any priest who paid the shekel does not thereby commit a sin. Are Yohanan Bizakai said to him not so, but a priest who does not pay the shekel commits a sin. The priest, however, used to explain the following verse to their advantage, and every meal offering of the priest shall be wholly made to smoke, it shall not be eaten. Now they argued since the omer and the two loaves and the shoe bread are ours, how could they be eaten? But according to Ben Bukri, since they are not to do obliged to bring it, pay the shekel. If one brings it, he should be considered a sinner, for he brings profane things to the temple court. The assumption is that they bring the shekel and hand it over to the community. Now I might have assumed that since scripture reads, and all valuations shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary, that only he to whom the obligation of the shekel applies is subject to the laws of valuation, but as to priests, since the obligation of the shekel does not apply to them or not subject to the laws of valuation therefore we are informed that they are said obey to him but the words and all the valuations serve to teach that all the valuations must each amount to no less than one seller rather said obey the inclusion of priests is necessary for this reason I might have assumed that since scripture reads and their redemption money from a month old shalt thou redeem them shall be according to the valuation that only he to whom the law of redeeming the firstborn applies is subject to the laws of valuation but as to priests since they are not included in the law concerning redemption therefore they are not subject to the law of valuations therefore we are informed that they are said robber to him if so since with regard to the ram of guilt offering scripture reads and he shall bring his forfeit unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock according to the valuation let us also argue that only he to whom the law of valuation applies is liable to bring a ram of guilt offerings but one of doubtful sex or other maphrodite who is not subject to the law of valuation is free from the obligation to offer up a ram of guilt offering rather said Rabbah or as some say are ashi the inclusion of priest is necessary for I might have said since scripture reads then he shall be set before the priest etc that only an Israelite is set before the priest but not a priest before a fellow priest therefore we are informed that priests who are included in the law of valuation what does all are fit to be made the subject of valuation include that includes one disfigured or afflicted with boils whence do we derive that for our rabbis have taught according to the valuation that includes a general valuation another interpretation according to the valuation i.e. one pays only for the valuation of a whole person but not for the valuation of his limbs one might have assumed that they exclude the valuation of Anything on which life the soul depends, therefore the text states persons, person souls, but not a dead person, hence I would exclude the dead but not the dying, therefore the text states that he shall be set before the priest and the priest shall value him, which means only one who can be set before the priest can be evaluated, but one who cannot be set before the priest cannot be evaluated either another interpretation persons, hence I could infer only the case of one evaluating. Person once do I know the case of one evaluating a hundred persons, the text therefore states persons, another interpretation persons, Talmud, Masarak and B, thence I could infer only the case of a man evaluating either man or woman, but once do we know the case of a woman evaluating a man or of a woman evaluating a woman, the text therefore states persons, another interpretation persons, that means to include one disfigured or afflicted with boils, for I might have assumed a vow according to.
but not one of doubtful sex or other maphrodite. The master taught according to thy valuation that includes a general valuation. What is a general valuation? For it was taught if someone says I assume the obligation of a general valuation, then he gives according to the minimum amount possible in valuations. What is the minimum due in valuations? Three shekels, but say perhaps fifty shekels. If you take hold of the larger amount, you may lose your hold, but if you take hold of the lower, you will keep. It then say perhaps one shekel as it is written and all the valuations shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary that passage refers to the regard to one's means what then is the purpose of the scriptural passage Arnaman in the name of Rabbi Abu said to tell us that in this case he is not a judge according to his means what is the reason because it is as if he had made an express statement of the minimum others say Arnaman in the name of Rabbi Abu he is a judge according to his means but that is self-evident I might have assumed that a general valuation is considered like an express statement therefore we are informed that it is regarded like a poor man's vow another interpretation according to the valuation i.e. he pays only in case of the dedication of a whole person but not for the valuation of his limbs but you have used this text to infer the rule concerning a general valuation read since instead of valuation it says according to the Valuation one might have assumed that this excludes anything on which life the soul depends therefore the text states person souls his souls but not the dead person but you have used that word for another purpose read since instead of person it says person since I would exclude the dead but not the dying therefore the text states he shall be set before the priest and the priest shall value him but if so you might exclude the dead also through inference from he shall be set and the priest shall value him in truth so wherefore then the exposition of person persons as we shall explain later on another interpretation person since I could infer the case of one evaluating one person whence do I know the case of one evaluating a hundred the text therefore states persons another interpretation person since I could infer only the case of a man evaluating either ma underscore and or woman but whence do I know the case of a woman evaluating a man or of a woman evaluating a Woman, the text therefore states persons another interpretation persons that means one disfigured or afflicted with boils but you have used the word for these other teachings no scriptural text is necessary for these because the balance between them is even hence all may be inferred therefrom the passage is necessary only for the inclusion of one disfigured or afflicted with boils then the valuation shall be that includes one of doubtful sex and an hermaphrodite among those who can have their worth out but why is a scriptural passage necessary for including these in the rule of those whose worth can be vowed let them be no worse than the worth of a palm tree if he said the worth of a palm tree do I oblige myself to pay what he not have to pay it said rabbit means to say that he is worth be assessed according to the importance of his limb I would have thought that since it is written about according to the valuation that whatsoever is affected by the law of evaluation is assessed according to the importance of the limb, but that whosoever is not affected by the laws of evaluation is not assessed according to the importance of the limb. Hence, the scriptural indication said, Abbe to him is indeed one to whom the laws of evaluation do not apply, assessed according to the importance of the limb. Was it not taught if someone said the head of the slave shall be consecrated to the sanctuary, then he and the sanctuary share it in partnership? If he said the head of the slave be sold to you, they assess its value between them. If he said the head of this ass is consecrated, he and the sanctuary share it in partnership. If he said the head of this ass is sold to you, they assess it between them. If he said the head of this cow is sold to you, he has sold no more than her head, and not only that, but even if he said the head of this cow is consecrated to the sanctuary, the sanctuary has no more than her head, and our papa said the reason why. There is no partnership in the case of a cow is because the head of an ox is sold in the butcher's shop. Now ass and cow are not affected by the law of valuations and yet are not assessed according to the importance of the limb but according to your own position what of the case of a slave to whom the law of valuation does apply and yet he is not assessed according to the importance of the limb rather there is no difficulty this latter buried refers to things dedicated to the altar the former to things dedicated to the repair of the house how did you explain the latter buried as referring to things dedicated to the altar but look at the second part and not only that but even if he said the head of this cow is consecrated to the sanctuary the sanctuary owns no more than her head why that let the sacred character spread so as to include the whole animal has it not been taught Talmud Masarakan if one said the leg of this animal shall be a burnt offering one might have assumed that the whole animal thereby becomes a burnt offering therefore the text states all that any man giveth thereof unto the Lord shall be holy i.e. only that thereof which he giveth shall be holy but not the whole thereof shall be holy one might have assumed that the whole becomes profane therefore the text states it shall be i.e. it retains its present character how then it is sold for the purchase of burnt offerings and the money realized with the exception of the value of it limb dedicated shall be profane this is the view of our Meir, our Jude, our Hosea and our Simeon say whence do we know that if a man said the leg of this animal shall be a burnt offering that the whole animal is a burnt offering therefore the text states all that any man giveth thereof unto the Lord shall be holy that means to include the whole now even according to the view that thereby the whole animal does not become consecrated that applies only to the vow of an organ upon which life does not Depend, but whenever a limb is vowed upon which the life of the animal depends, the whole animal becomes consecrated. This is no difficulty. One speaks of the vow of the animal itself, the other of the vow of its equivalent in money. But it was the master himself who said that if someone consecrates a male animal in its money equivalent, that animal becomes consecrated in itself. That is no difficulty. One case speaks of his having dedicated the whole, the other of his dedicating one member of the body. But even concerning the dedication of one member, it is a matter of doubt. For Rabbi asked if a man had dedicated one member in its money value, how then the question was asked about a perfect animal. Whereas here we are dealing with a blemished one similar to the donkey discussed above. But the case of the dedication of a blemished one is also doubtful. For Rabbi asked if someone says the money value of my head is dedicated to the altar, what then the question was asked before he heard this teaching but now that he has heard this teaching it is no more doubtful to him to turn to the main text rabbi ask if a man said the money value of my head be for the altar shall he be valued according to the importance of this or shall he not be so valued do we say that it never happens that a vow regarding a person's worth be not assessed according to the importance of the limb or on the other hand do we say it never happens with regard to a consecration for the altar that the consecration is determined by the importance of the limb the question remains unanswered rabbi ask if someone said the valuation of myself i undertake to pay for the altar is he a judge according to his means or not do we say it is never found in connection with valuation that one is not a judge according to one's means or on the other hand it never happens with regard to any vow to the altar that one be a judge according to his means the question remains Unanswered Arashi asked if a man dedicated a field of possession for the altar what then do we say it never occurs that a field of possession can be redeemed except on the basis of 50 shekels for each part of the field sufficient for the sowing of a homer of barley or perhaps we say it does not happen with regard to any gift for the altar that it be redeemed otherwise than in accord with its actual value the question remains unanswered mission a person less than one month old may have his worth out but not his valuation Gemara our rabbis taught if one evaluates a person less than one month old our mayor says he gives his worth its market value but the sages say he has said nothing wherein are they of divided opinion our mayor says no man utters his words in vain and knowing that a person less than one month old cannot be made the subject of evaluation and having spoken he makes up his mind to vow his worth the sages however hold that a man may utter his words in vain According to whose view of the disputants will be what Arkidal said in the name of Rab who said if one said the valuation of this vessel is upon me he shall pay its worth that is in accord with our mayor but this is self-evident you might have said it could be in accord with the view of the rabbi sages for in the other case one could have heard in thinking that just as a child of one month has valuation thus also one less than one month old but in this case where there is nothing to err about for a man surely knows that a vessel has no valuation and therefore he had intended his statement to mean to vow the vessel's worth therefore we are informed that even here the sages do not so hold Talmud, Masarak and B but why was it necessary for Rab to state this ruling on the view of our mayor one might have thought the reason for our mayor in that case was that he decreed the obligation to pay in the case of a child less than one month old out of consideration for one which was one month old but that in the case here where no such decree is warranted one might assume that our mayor would
consecrated as from now already and I shall offer it up after having purchased it but that he did not mean it's worth therefore he informs us that this is not so Arashi said this applies only where he said I undertake the responsibility for an animal but not if he said I assume the obligation to consecrate this animal Mishnah an idol worshipper according to our mayor can be made the subject of evaluation but cannot evaluate whereas according to our Judah he may evaluate but cannot be made. The subject of evaluation both agree however that he can both bow another's worth and have his worth bowed by others Gemara our rabbis taught the children of Israel may evaluate but idol worshippers may not evaluate one might have assumed that they cannot be made the subject of evaluation either therefore the text states man these are the words of our mayor said our mayor now that one scriptural verse includes and the other excludes whence am I justified in saying he may be made the subject of a valuation but may not evaluate himself it is because scripture has included more among those subject to valuation than among those fit to evaluate for a deaf mute and imbecile and a minor each may be made the subject of evaluation but is not fit to evaluate our Judah said the children of Israel may be made the subject of evaluation but idol worshippers are not fit to be made the subject of evaluation one might have assumed that they the latter are not fit to evaluate either therefore the text Statesman said Arjuda since one verse includes and the other excludes whence do I come to make the statement that idol worshippers are fit to evaluate and are not subject to valuation because scripture has included more among those fit to evaluate than among those subject to valuation for one of doubtful sex and other maphrodite are fit to evaluate but are not subject to valuation said Robert the decision of our mayor appeals to logic but not the reason the reason of Arjuda is logical but not his decision the decision of our mayor appeals to logic as it is written you have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God his reason does not appeal for he argues from a case of a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor but it is different with them since they have no intelligence the reason of Arjuda is logical for he deduces it from a case of one of doubtful sex and other maphrodite which although endowed with intelligence are yet excluded by the divine law from evaluation his decision. However does not appeal as it is written ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God how indeed does our Judah deal with ye have nothing to do with us or his said in the name of Abimi his valuation money must be hidden but then one should not be guilty of sacrilege in connection with them for it was taught concerning the five kinds of sin offerings which must be left to die and all monies that must be cast into the dead sea one must not derive any benefit from them nor is one guilty of sacrilege if one has used them why then was it taught with regard to the consecration of idol worshippers these things apply only to things consecrated for the altar but things consecrated for temple repairs are subject to the law of sacrilege rather said Rabbah it was due to the weakening of the hands as it is written and the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and harried them while they were building Talmud Masarak and one buried the taught of an idol Worshipper offers a free will gift towards temple repairs one accepts it from him whilst another buried the taught one does not accept it from him said RL in the name of our Yohanan this is no difficulty the first applies to the beginning the latter to the end for RC said in the name of our Yohanan in the beginning one should not accept from them even salt or water whereas at the end one may not accept a thing that can be easily identified but something that cannot easily be identified one may accept what is a thing that can be easily identified our Joseph said like a cubit of metal keeping off the raven our Joseph raised an objection and a letter unto Azaf the keeper of the king's park that he may give me timber to make beams etc Abbe said it is different with the government because it will not retract for Samuel has said if the government said I will uproot a mountain it will uproot the mountain and not retract Rab Judah said in the name of Rab if an idol worshipper Separated the teramah from his pile of produce then we examine him if he said I have separated it with the same intention as an Israelite it is to be handed to the priests but if not it must be hidden because we consider the possibility of his having in his heart intended it for the Lord an objection was raised against that if an idol worshipper had dedicated a beam to the sanctuary upon which the name of God is inscribed he is to be examined if he said I have separated it with the same intention as an Israelite then one should cut off the part containing the name of God and use the rest but if he does not offer this explanation it must be hidden away because we fear his heart intention may have been to dedicate it to the Lord the reason then for this decision is because the name of God is inscribed thereon and only therefore does it require to be hidden away but if the name of God were not inscribed thereupon then indeed it would not have to be hidden away. No, even if the name of God were not inscribed thereupon, it would likewise have to be hidden away, and it is exactly this that we are told that although the name of God is thereon inscribed, he need but cut off that portion and use the rest for the name of God not in its proper place is not considered sacred, for it was taught if it the name of God was written upon the handles of a vessel or upon the props of a bed, behold, it shall be cut off and hidden. Arnaman said in the name of our Abuah. If one says the cellar is dedicated to charity, he is permitted to exchange it. Now it was assumed that this is permitted only for himself, but not for anybody else, but it was stated that our said in the name of our Yohanan that it is permitted both for oneself and for someone else. Our Zeira said we have learned that only where he said I take upon myself generally, but if he said I take upon myself to give this, then he is obliged to give the cellar upon Robert Demert on the contrary. The Opposite is logical if he said behold the seller I take upon myself to pay that he may use it for himself so that he may be responsible for it but when he said I take upon myself a seller he should not be permitted to exchange it but the fact is it makes no difference it was taught in accord with Rabbah vows are like charity but consecrations to the sanctuary are not like charity what does that mean neither vows nor dedications are charity is it not rather this that is meant charity is like vows in respect of the prohibition thou shalt not delay it but is not like a consecration to the sanctuary because anything so consecrated one must not use whereas money dedicated to charity one may meantime use for oneself our Kahana said I reported this teaching before our Zebit of Nihardi whereupon he said this is how you stated it we however stated thus our in the name of our Abba based on Rab said if one said the seller is dedicated to charity he may exchange it both for himself or for someone else independent of whether he had said I take it upon myself in general or I take it upon myself to pay the seller or rabbis taught if one said the seller shall be for charity then before it has reached the hand of the charity treasurer it is permitted to exchange it but after it has come into the treasurer's hand it is forbidden to exchange it Talmud, Masara can be but it is not so for Arjane borrowed and paid it afterwards it is different with Arjane. For what he did was acceptable to the poor for the more he delayed the more did he succeed in collecting and bringing into them a rabbis taught if an Israelite dedicated a candlestick or a lamp to the synagogue he is not permitted to exchange it or I had thought that was to say it may not be changed either for a secular or a religious purpose whereupon RMI said to him this is what our Yohanan said we have learned of the prohibition only in connection with a secular purpose but for a Religious purpose it is permitted to exchange the object dedicated for RC said in the name of our Yohanan if an idol worshipper had dedicated a candlestick or a lamp to the synagogue then before the name of its owner has become forgotten it is forbidden to exchange it after the name of the owner has been forgotten it is permitted to change it now to what purpose is it to be changed shall I say for secular use then why speak of an idol worshipper's gift the same applies to that of an Israelite hence you must say for a religious use and nevertheless the reason why it may not be changed is because an idol worshipper would create a row about it but in the case of an Israelite who would not create a row about it it would be proper to change it Shazrak and Arab made a gift of a lamp to the synagogue of Rab Judah Rabbah changed it as use and Rabbah took it amiss some say Rabbah changed it and Rabbah took it amiss others say the sections of Pumadi the changed it and both Rabbah and Rabbah rebuked them for it he who changed it held it would be a rare occurrence whereas he who rebuked held it may happen that he comes mission one at the point of death or about to be put to death cannot have his worth bowed nor be subject to valuation our Hanabi Ahabia said he is fit to be made the subject of evaluation because his price is fixed our Jose said he may bow another's worth evaluate and consecrate to the sanctuary and if he caused damage he is obliged to make restitution. Gemara it is quite right that one at the point of death cannot have his worth bowed because he has no money value nor can he be made the subject of evaluation because he is not fit to be set and valued but as regards one about to be put to death whilst it is true that he cannot
to lesser penalties of death for which at least when committed in error atonement is possible the text therefore states any devoted thing etc. R. Jose says he may vow another's worth evaluate but did the first tana say that he may rather there is no dispute whatsoever that he may vow another's worth evaluate and consecrate the dispute touches only the case of his having caused damage the first tana holding that if he had caused damage he is not obliged to make compensation whereas R. Jose holds. He is obliged to make compensation when he has caused damage. What principle are they disputing? Our Joseph said they are disputing whether an oral debt can be collected from the ears. The first tana holding an oral debt cannot be collected from the ears, whereas our Jose considers it can be collected. Rabbis said all agree that an oral debt cannot be collected from the ears. What they are here disputing is the nature of a debt arising from the law of the Torah. The first tana holding that a debt arising from the law of the Torah is not to be considered equal to one acknowledged in a document of indebtedness. Whilst our Jose considers it like one acknowledged in a document of indebtedness, there are some who refer it to the following matter. If one about to be executed wounded others, he is obliged to make reparation. But if others have wounded him, they are free from reparation. Our Simeon B. Eliezer said even if he has wounded someone, he is free because he may not be placed before the court. Of Log and Talmud, Masarakana from this it would appear that the first Tana holds that he may be placed before the court of Log and said our Joseph they are disputing whether an oral debt can be collected from the ears. The first Tana holding an oral debt may be collected from the ears, whilst our Simeon B. Eliezer holds it cannot be collected. Rabbis said all agree that an oral debt cannot be collected from the ears. They are disputing here whether an obligation arising from the law of it. Torah may be considered as one written in a document of indebtedness. The first Tana holding it is to be regarded like one acknowledged in a document of indebtedness, whilst our Simeon B. Eliezer holds it is not to be regarded like one acknowledged in a document of indebtedness. An objection was raised if one dug a pit in a public thoroughfare and an ox fell upon him and killed him, the owner of the latter is free, and even more if the ox should die than the ears of the owner of the pit must repay. Its money value to the owner of the ox said RL in the name of Rabbis speaks of the case where he stood before the court of law but the text reads and killed him said R. Abiyahab it means he hurt him fatally but did not R. Naman say that R. Hagari killed and buried him but the law is that the ears are liable where the judges were sitting at the opening of the pit or Rabbis taught if one is about to be executed one sprinkles for him the blood of the sin offering or the blood of the guilt offering but if he sinned at that time one is no more obliged to attend to him what is the reason R. Joseph said we must not put off his execution said Abay if so then concerning the first part two that refers to the case that his sacrifice by that hour was killed already but if it had not been slaughtered before that hour what then would be the law presumably it would not be so then instead of having the text read if he sinned at that time they do not attend to him let it Distinction be made with reference to the sacrifice itself. These things apply only when his sacrifice by that hour had been slaughtered already. But if his sacrifice had not been slaughtered by that hour, one does not sprinkle of his blood upon him. This indeed is what he said. These things apply only if by that hour his sacrifice had been slaughtered already. But if his sacrifice had not been slaughtered yet, then his case is like that of one who sinned at that hour and to whom therefore one need not attend in this matter. Mishnah: If a woman is about to be executed, one does not wait for her until she gives birth. But if she had already sat on the birth stool, one waits for her until she gives birth. If a woman has been put to death, one may use her hair. If an animal has been put to death, it is forbidden to make any use of it. Gemara, but that is self-evident, for it is her body. It is necessary to teach it. For one might have assumed, since Scripture says, according as a woman's husband. Shall lay upon him that it the unborn child is the husband's property of which he should not be deprived, therefore we are informed that it is not so, but perhaps the former point of view may indeed be the law said Aravo in the name of our Yohan and scripture says they shall die also both of them that includes the child, but this verse is required for the inference that they must both be of equal condition as our Joseph teaches we infer it from also, but if she had already SAT on it. Birth stool, what is the reason as soon as it moves from its place in the womb it is another body Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, if a woman is about to be executed, one strikes her against her womb so that the child may die first to avoid her being disgraced. That means to say that otherwise she dies first, but we have an established assumption principle that the child dies first, for we learned a child one day old inherits and bequeaths and our she's hate said in explanation he inherits. The mother's property to bequeath it to his brothers from his father now this as is clearly indicated applies only to a child one day old but not to an embryo because it would die first and no son already in the grave can inherit from his mother to bequeath to his paternal brothers this applies only to her natural death because the child's life is very frail the drop of poison from the angel of death enters and destroys its vital organs but in the case of death by execution she dies. First but there was a case in which the child moved three times Mar son of Arashi said that is analogous to the tail of a lizard which moves after being cut off Arnaman said in the name of Samuel if a woman who has been sitting on the birth stool died on a Sabbath one may bring a knife and cut her womb open to take out the child but that is self-evident what is he doing Talmud, Masarak and be only cutting flesh Rabbi said it is necessary to permit the fetching of the knife by way of a Public thoroughfare, but what is he informing us that in case of doubt one may desecrate the Sabbath? Surely we have learned already if debris falls down upon one and there is doubt whether he is there or not, or whether he is alive or dead, whether he is a Canaanite or an Israelite, one may remove the debris from above him. You might have said their permission was given because the person in question had at least presumption of having been alive, but here where it, the embryo did not have such original presumption of life, one might say no desecration of the Sabbath shall be permitted. Therefore, we are informed that it is if a woman has been put to death, etc. But why these things are forbidden for any use? Rab said this refers to the case where she had said, Give my hair to my daughter, but if she had similarly said, Give my hand to my daughter, would we have given it to her? Rab said it refers to a wig. Now the reason for the permission is that she had said, Give it, but if she had not said give it, it would have been as part of her body and forbidden for any use, but this matter was questioned by our Jose Bihanan for our Jose Bihanan asked what about the hair of righteous women and Rabbah had remarked his question refers to their wig. The question of our Jose Bihanan referred to the case of such wig it's hanging on a peg, but here the wig is attached to her head, therefore the reason it is permitted is because she said give it, but if she had not said give it, it would be as her body and forbidden this appeared difficult to Arnaman B. Isaac, for it is placed in juxtaposition to the law concerning an animal, hence just as there the hair is part of the body here too, it should be part of the body rather said Arnaman. In the one case the woman's it is the actual death which renders the body prohibited for any use, whereas in the other case the animals the close of the legal proceedings, the pronouncement of the death sentence renders it prohibited. For any usually by taught in accord with Rab and he also taught in accord with Arnaman B. Isaac he taught in accord with Rab if a woman went forth to be executed and she said give my hair to my daughter one would give it to her but if she died before making such a demand one would not give it because the dead must not be used for any purpose but that is self evident say rather the ornaments of the dead are prohibited for any use it was taught in accord with Arnaman B. Isaac if a woman died. Her hair is permitted for use if an animal was put to death it is forbidden for any use and what is the difference between the one and the other in the one case it is only the actual death which renders the body prohibited for any use and in the other case the pronouncement of the death sentence in itself renders it prohibited for any use C H A P T E R I I Mishnah there is no valuation less than one selling or more than fifty houses that if one paid a seller and became rich he need not give any. More, but if he gave less than a seller and became rich, he must pay fifty sellers. If he had five sellers in his possession, our mayor says then he need not give more than one. Whereas the sages say he must give them all, for there is no valuation of less than one seller, nor more than fifty sellers. Gemara, there is no valuation less than one seller. Once do we know that for scripture said, and all valuations shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary, i.e., all valuations which you evaluate shall be of no less than a shekel, nor more than fifty sellers, as it is written, fifty. If he had five sellers in his possession, etc., what is the reason of our mayor? Scripture says fifty, and it is also written shekel, i.e., either fifty or one shekel, and the
The payment for the first are at a Abba asked if he had five sellers and said in one utterance two of my valuations be upon me to pay how then shall I say since he said it in one utterance the obligations arise simultaneously so that he would have to pay two and a half for the one valuation and two and a half for the other or is the whole sum due for each of them the question remains unanswered there is no valuation less than one seller nor more etc why is this restatement necessary? This is what we are told there is none less than one seller but there are some above one seller there is none above fifty sellers but there are some below fifty sellers and if the teaching is stated anonymously in accord with the rabbi's mission if a woman goes astray in her reckoning there is no reopening for her of an account earlier than seven nor later than after seventeen days Gamara our rabbis taught if a woman astray in her reckoning said I saw uncleanness for one day then her re count begins after seventeen days if she says I saw uncleanness for two days her recount commences after seventeen days if she says I saw uncleanness for three days her recount commences after seventeen days if she says I saw uncleanness for four days her recount commences after sixteen days if she says I saw uncleanness for five days her recount commences after fifteen days if she says I saw uncleanness for six days her recount commences after fourteen days if she says I saw Uncleanness for seven days her recount commences after thirteen days if she says I saw uncleanness for eight days her recount commences after twelve days if she says I saw uncleanness for nine days her recount commences after eleven days if she says I saw uncleanness for ten days her recount commences after ten days if she says I saw uncleanness for eleven days her recount commences after nine days if she says I saw uncleanness for twelve days her recount commences after eight days Talmud, Masarak and B if she says I saw uncleanness for thirteen days then her recount commences after seven days for the reopening of the net account does not come before seven nor later than after seventeen days are at a Abba said to Rabbi why all this reckoning let her count seven days and be permitted to have intercourse he answered we are meaning to set her right concerning her menstruation and its recommencement our rabbis taught all women who are astray in there. Reckoning are Zabbath and must offer a sacrifice which must not be eaten with the exception of those whose nidder recount started after the seventh or after the eighth day who must offer a sacrifice which is to be eaten but are women astray in their reckoning Zabbath furthermore must a woman who has had an issue one day or two days at all offer up a sacrifice rather red Zabbath who are astray in their reckoning must offer a sacrifice which is not to be eaten with the exception of the woman whose nidder recount starts after seven or after eight days who must offer up a sacrifice that is to be eaten Mishnah no signs of leprosy are shut up less than one week and none more than two weeks Gemara no less than one week refers to human leprosy none more than three weeks refers to leprosy of houses our Papa said by righteousness is like the mighty mountains refers to human leprosy thy judgments are like the great deep refers to the leprosy of houses what is the simple meaning of it Scriptural verse were it not for thy righteousness as great as the mighty mountains who could stand before thy judgments as profound as the great deep Rabbi said thy righteousness is like the mighty mountains because thy judgments are like the great deep wherein are they conflicting in the dispute of our Eliezer and our Jose Bihanna for it was reported that our Eliezer says he suppresses our Jose Bihanna says he forgives Rabbi agrees with the view of our Eliezer whilst Rab Judah concurs with that of our Jose Bihanna Mishnah there are never less than four full months in the year nor did it seem right to have more than eight the two loaves were consumed never earlier than the second nor later than the third day the shoe bread was consumed never earlier than the ninth nor later than the eleventh day an infant may never be circumcised earlier than the eighth nor later than the twelfth day tomorrow what does did not seem right to have more than eight mean Arunah said it did not appear Right to the sages to make more than eight months full, wherefore is the difference with regard to nine that they would not make full because if they did not stop at eight Talmud, Masarak and the new moon would come three days too early, but now too it would come two days too early. This is in accord with what our Meshachia said. It refers to a case where the preceding year was prolonged here too. The reference is to a year following a prolonged year, and the prolongation of a year is one month. But put one full month against one incomplete month, and there will be still one day left. People do not pay too much attention to that. Ullah said the meaning is it did not seem right to the sages to make more than eight defective months. He the states here a reason. What is the reason that it did not seem right to the sages to have less than four full months? Because it did not seem right to them to have more than eight defective months. Why not nine? Because in that case the new moon. Would be coming three days too late, but now too it would be coming two days too late. That is to be explained in accord with our measure. It refers to a case where the preceding year was prolonged here too. The reference is to a year following a prolonged year. Deduct one defective month against one full month, and still there will be one day left. They, the people will say that the moon has actually been seen whilst we had paid no attention. Talmud, Masarak, and B. In what principle do they differ in regard to the prolonged year? For it was taught by how much is a year prolonged by thirty days? Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said by a month an objection was raised. The feast of weeks can fall only on the day of the waving, and the new year can fall only on either the day of the waving or the day following the night of the last day of the full month of Nisan. Now that will be right according to Allah. If eight defective months could be arranged, but not full ones, hence this may happen. Thus, if both. Our defective it falls on the day of the waving if one is full and the other defective it falls on the day following the night of the last day of the full month but according to Arhuna who says one does make eight full months it may happen that it falls on the day following the day after the night of the last day of the full month Arhuna will answer you but is it indeed right according to Allah only eight full months are not made but we do make seven now can it not happen that we arrange them not in winter but in the summer with the result that it would possibly fall upon the day following the day after the last day of the full month rather this is in agreement with the others for it was taught others taught between one feast of weeks and the other and between one new year and the other there is an interval of no more than four days of the week or in the case of a prolonged year five days but at all events on the view of the others it could not fall on the day of the waving. Our Meshach said the reference is to a prolonged year and the prolongation of a year is by thirty days deduct one full month against the other full one and it will fall upon the day of the waving said our Adabi Ahab to Rabba do others intend teaching us how to count the number this is what they convey to us that it is not obligatory to proclaim a new moon on the basis of having seen it Rabba but there are days made of hours and days of thirty years since they do not occur. Every year he does not count them Samuel to agreed with the view of Arunah for Samuel said the lunar year consists of no less than three hundred and fifty two nor of more than three hundred and fifty six days how is that if the two are full there are fifty six if the two are incomplete fifty two if one is complete and one incomplete fifty four an objection was raised if one said I shall be a Nazi right according to the number of the days of the solar year then he must count for his. Nazi right ship 365 days according to the years of the sun if he said according to the days of the lunar year he must count for his Nazi right ship 354 days according to the days of the lunar year now if that account above were right at times you find a year of 356 days with regard to vows go after human parlance as well as after the majority of years rabbi to held the view of our for it was taught rabbi happened to have arranged for nine defective months and the moon of Tishri was seen in its due season whereupon rabbi was amazed and said we have arranged nine incomplete ones and yet the moon of Tishri appeared in due season our Simeon B rabbi said to him perhaps this happened to be a prolonged year Talmud Masarak and A and the prolongation of a year is by 30 days and last year we made the two full put the three full against the three defective and it will come to its proper place he answered to in light of Israel so it was Mishnah they blew never less than twenty-one blasts in the sanctuary and never more than forty-eight they played never on less than two harps or more than six nor ever on less than two flutes or more than twelve on twelve days in the year was the flute hail played before the altar at the killing of the first Passover sacrifice at the killing of the second Passover sacrifice on the first festival day of Passover on the festival day of the feast of weeks and on the eight days of the feast of tabernacles and they did not play on a pipe a bub of bronze but on a reed pipe because its tune is sweeter nor was any but a pipe solo used for closing a tune because it makes a pleasant finale they were slaves of the priests according to our mayor our Jose said they were of the families Beth Hakarim Beth Zipporah and from Emmaus from which priests would marry women our Hannah B Antigona said they were Elibiel Tamara
This is no more than a signal according to whom will be the following teaching of Arkahana. There may be no interruption whatever between Tekiah and Teruah according to whom according to Arjuna, but this is obvious you might have said it may be in accord even with the rabbis and it is taught us only to exclude the view of our Yohanan who said that if one heard nine sounds even in the course of nine hours during the day he had fulfilled his duty therefore we are informed that this is not so. But say perhaps it is indeed so if that were the case what means no interruption whatever on twelve days in the year was the flute played etc. Why just on these days because an individual completes the Hallel Psalms on them for our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Bij Hosea there are eighteen days on which an individual completes the Hallel the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles the eight days of Hanukkah the first festival day of Passover and the festival day of the Feast of Weeks in. The exile one praying individually completes the hell on twenty-one days the nine days of the Feast of Tabernacles the eight days of Hanukkah the two festival days of Passover and the two festival days of the Feast of Weeks why this difference that on the Feast of Tabernacles we complete hell on all the days and on the Passover festival we do Talmud, Masarak and be Talmud, Masarak and be not do so on all of its days the days of the Feast of Tabernacles are differentiated from one. Another in respect of the sacrifices do their own whereas the days of Passover are differentiated from one another in respect of their sacrifices let it then be read on the Sabbath which is distinguished by its sacrifices its Sabbath is not called a festival but one of new moon which is called a festival let the complete hell be said on it new moon is not sanctified as to prohibition of labor as it is written ye shall have a song as in the night when a feast is hallowed i.e. only the Night sanctified towards a festival requires a song, but the night which is not sanctified towards a festival does not require a song. And let the hell be said on the new year and on the day of atonement, both of which are called festival and are sanctified by the prohibition of labor that is not possible because of our above. For our above said the ministering angel said before the Holy One, Blessed be he, why do not the Israelites sing a song before you on the new year and on the day of atonement? He answered them, Would that be possible? The king sits on the throne of judgment with the books of those destined to live and destined to die before him, and Israel singing a song before me. But there is Hanukkah on which neither one nor the other condition applies, and the hell is said that is due to the miracle. Then let it be said on Purim on which two a miracle occurred, said our Isaac. It is not said because no song hell is said for a miracle that occurred outside the holy. Lent to this Arnam and be Isaac demurred, but there is the exodus from Egypt which constitutes a miracle that happened outside the land and yet we say hell there it is due to the fact taught for it was taught before Israel entered the holy land all the lands were considered fit for song to be said if a miracle had occurred in their boundaries once Israel had entered the land no other countries were considered fit for song to be said Arnam and however answered the reading of the Megillah. That is its Purim's hell Rabbah said it fits quite well their praise yes servants of the Lord but not servants of Pharaoh but your servants of the Lord not servants of Ahasuerus surely they are still servants of Ahasuerus but according to Arnam and who says the reading of the Megillah is its hell was it not taught that after Israel had entered the land no other land was considered fit to sing hell about after Israel was exiled the other countries were restored to their original. Fitness they did not play on the pipe of bronze. He the tana begins with hail and closes with above said our papa hail is the same of above this latter being its right name and why was it called hail because its tune is sweet holly our rabbis taught there was a pipe in the sanctuary which was smooth and then made of reed and from the days of Moses and its sound was pleasant the king commanded to overlay it with gold whereupon its sound was no more pleasant than its overlay was taken off. And its sound was pleasant again as before there was a symbol in the sanctuary from the days of Moses made of bronze and its sound was pleasant then it became damaged the sages sent for craftsmen from Alexandria of Egypt and they mended it but its sound was not pleasant anymore thereupon they removed the improvement and its sound became as pleasant as it was before bronze mortar was in the sanctuary from the days of Moses and it would mix the drugs when it became damaged the sages sent for. Craftsmen from Alexandria of Egypt who mended it but it would no more mix the drugs as well as it used to whereupon they removed the improvement and it would mix them well again as before these two vessels were left over from the first sanctuary and after they had been damaged there was no remedy for them it is with reference to them that David said they were of burnished brass and bright brass in connection with them it is said also and two vessels of fine bright brass precious as gold rab and Samuel were disputing one said each of them had the full weight of two of gold the other held both of them had the weight of one of gold our Joseph learned both of them had the weight of one of gold it was taught Nathan said they were two each which a name is the written text which one should read not your name two but name double ones are Simeon Begamaliel taught the silo was gushing forth through a mouth of the size of an isar the king commanded and it was widened so that its waters be Increased, but the waters diminished thereupon it was narrowed again whereupon it had its original flow to make true that which was said let not the wise man glory in his wisdom neither let the mighty man glory in his might thus also would our Simeon be Gamaliel say there was no herd in the sanctuary what is herd olim a said a musical instrument table worked by pressure of water because its sound was heavy and disturbed the music rabbi Bishila in the name of Armahan on it. Authority of Samuel said there was a magrifah in the sanctuary it had ten holes each of which produced Talmud, Masarak and ten different kinds of sounds with the result that the whole amounted to one hundred kinds of sounds a tana taught it was one cubit long one cubit high from it projected a handle which had ten holes each of them produced one hundred kinds of sounds amounting for the whole to one thousand kinds of sounds said Arnam and B. Isaac to remember whose teaching it is the Beritha. Exaggerates they were slaves of the priests shall we say they are of conflicting opinions concerning the following principle he who said they the players of the instruments were slaves holds that the essential in the music of the sanctuary was the singing with the mouth the instrumental music being just for sweetening the sound whereas he who said that they were love it holds the instrumental music to have been the essential but if you reason this way what will appear as our Jose's view of he holds that the essential of the sanctuary music was the singing with the mouth that the instrumental music should have been satisfactory if performed by slaves if on the other hand he holds that instrumental music was the essential it would have to be done by love it's in reality he holds that vocal music was the essential here however they are disputing as to whether one may promote one from the took and to noble families and to the enjoyment of tithes he who said that they the players of the instruments were slaves would hold one may not promote anyone from the Dukan to either noble families or to the enjoyment of tithes whereas he who said they were lovets would hold one may promote anyone from the Dukan both to marriage into noble families and to the enjoyment of tithes whereas he who said that they the players of instruments were Israelites would hold that one may promote anyone from the Dukan to marriage into noble families but not to the enjoyment of tithes. Our rabbis taught the omission of the song invalidates the sacrifice this is the view of our Meir the sages however hold that the omission of the song does not invalidate the sacrifice what is the reason of our Meir our Eliezer said because scripture said and I have given the lovets they are given to Aaron and to his sons from among the children of Israel and to make atonement for the children of Israel i.e. just as atonement is indispensable so is the song indispensable and the rabbis this. Analogy is with reference to another teaching of our Eliezer for our Eliezer said just as the atonement is performed during the day so does the song take place during the day Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel once do we know that fundamentally the song is obligatory on the basis of the Torah as it is said and shall he minister in the name of the Lord his God now which ministry is it in the course of which the Lord's name is mentioned you must say it is the song but perhaps it is the priest's raising of the hands to bless in scripture said to minister unto him and to bless in his name it follows that the priest's blessing in itself is no ministry our Mahana said it is derived from here because thou didst not serve the Lord thy God in joyfulness and with gladness of heart now which service is it that is in joyfulness and with gladness of heart you must say it is song but perhaps it means the words of the Torah as it is written the precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart they are described as rejoicing the heart but not as gladdening the heart but say it refers to first fruits as it is written and thou shalt rejoice in all the good they are called good but not gladdening the heart our Mahana said once do we know that the offering of the first fruits requires a song we infer that from the analogy of the words good good which occur here too but that is not so for our Samuel be Namani
Also it is said take up SEU the melody and sound the timbrel and it is said also they lift up SEU their voices they sing for joy etc. Hanani the son of the brother of our Joshua derived it from here Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice Talmud, Masarak and B.I.E. concerning the voice Arashi derived it from here it came even to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard our Jonathan derived it from here that they die not neither they nor Yai. Just as you at the service of the altar so they too at the service of the altar it was taught also thus that they die not neither they nor Yebizia by engaging in their work or they by engaging in yours would incur penalty of death they however by engaging in another's work of their own group would be incurring penalty for transgression but not death Abbe said we have it on tradition that a singing Levi who did his colleague's work at the gate incurs the penalty of death as it is said. And those that were to pitch before the tabernacle eastward before the tent of meeting toward the sun rising were Moses and Aaron etc. And the stranger that drew nigh was to be put to death. What stranger is meant here would you say a real stranger non-priest but that has been mentioned by scripture already rather must it mean a stranger to this particular service an objection was raised concerning a Levite choister that attended to the temple gates or a gatekeeping Levite who sang as to. Whether they are guilty of a transgression or incurring penalty of death that is a matter of dispute among Tanaim for it was taught it happened that our Joshua be you went to assist our Yohan and be in the fastening of the temple doors whereupon he the latter said to him my son turn back for you are of the choristers not of the doorkeepers would you not say that they were of divided opinion here and that one held he incurs the penalty of death and for this reason the rabbis forbade. Their assisting whereas the other held that only a transgression was involved whence the rabbis did not decree this preventive measure no both agree that only a transgression is involved and their point of issue is the following one holds that the rabbis forbade assisting as a preventive measure the other holding that they did not forbid assisting as a preventive measure are often asked does a free will burnt offering of a community require song or not the divine law says your burnt offerings. Which means no matter whether they are obligatory or free will offerings or in saying your burnt offerings does perhaps the divine law mean those of all Israel come and here and Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar and when the burnt offering began the song of the Lord began also and the trumpets together with the instruments of David king of Israel what need was there here for song would you say it was on account of the daily obligatory burnt offering that surely Needed no consultation, rather it was one in connection with a free will burnt offering. Said our Joseph, no, it was the burnt offering offered on the new moon, and it was questionable as to whether the new month has been fixed in its right time, so that it should be offered up or not. Said Abay to him, how can you say so? Is it not written? And on the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end, and Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar, etc. Rather said Rami the son of Ar. Yeah, but the question was with reference to the lamb offered up with the omer, namely was the new month decreed in its right time or not, so that the lamb may be offered. Ar to this they should have seen when the paschal lamb had been sacrificed, when the leavened bread had been eaten. Rather said Ar it is the same as with the messenger of the congregation who consults formally asks for permission to start the prayer. Now that you have come to this answer, say even if it was the case. Of the daily obligatory burnt offering, yet there is no difficulty. It is the same as with any messenger of a community who consults his congregation. Come and hear our Jose said good things are brought about on a good auspicious day and evil ones on a bad one. It is said the day on which the first temple was destroyed was the ninth of and it was at the going out of the Sabbath and at the end of the seventh sabbatical year the priestly guard was that of Jehovah of the priests and Levites were standing on their platform singing the song. What song was it? And he hath brought upon them their iniquity and will cut them off in their evil. They had no time to complete the song with the Lord our God will cut them off before the enemies came and overwhelmed them. The same happened the second time, the second sanctuary's destruction. Now what need was there for song? Would you say that it was on account of the daily burnt offering, but that could not be for on the seventeenth of Thomas the continual sacrifice had been abolished hence it was on account of a free will burnt offering but how could you think so why should an obligatory offering have been impossible and a free will offering available that is no difficulty a young ox may accidentally have come to them said Rabbah or as some say Arashi but how could you think so the song of the day was the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof whereas the verse and he hath brought upon them their iniquity belongs to the song due on the fourth day of the week rather what you must say is it was just a lamentation text that had come to their mouth but it says they were standing upon the platform rather say that is in accord with Rush Lakish who said the song may be sung even without any attending sacrifice but that principle might be applied to a voluntary burnt offering too that might lead to an offense how is it there with come and hear Armari the son of Arkahana taught over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings just as the burnt offering is most holy so are the peace offerings referred to most holy and just as the peace offerings have a definite time fixed for them so have the burnt offerings a definite time fixed for them Talmud, Masa reckoned the following question was asked do libations offered up by themselves require a song or not since our Samuel Binamani Amani had said once do we know that one does not sing the sanctuary song except over wine etc do we say it over wine alone or do we say it only when the sacrifice includes food and drink but not over drink alone come and hear our Jose said good things are brought about on an auspicious day etc now what need was there for song would you say it was on account of an obligatory burnt offering but that could not be for on the 17th of Tammuz the continual offering was abolished and if it was on account of a voluntary burnt offering did not Armari the son of Arkahana teach that such did not Require a song, hence it must have been the song on account of libation, said Rabbah, or as some say, Arashi, but how could you think so? The song of the day was the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, whereas the verse and he brought upon them their iniquity belongs to the song due on the fourth day of the week. Rather say it was a verse of lamentation that came to their mouth, but it says, and they were standing on their platform, rather say that is in accord with Resh Lakish for Resh. Lakish said the song may be sung even without any attending sacrifice, then let the same be said for libations too that might lead to an offense to turn to the above text. Our Jose said good things are brought about on an auspicious day, etc. At the first time it was at the end of the seventh year, how could that have been? Is it not written in the five and twentieth year of our captivity in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after that the city was? Smitten now, which is the year the beginning of which falls on the tenth of Tishri, say this is the Jubilee year, and if you should think that the sanctuary was destroyed in the first year of the seven year cycle, consider there are from the first year of one seven year cycle to the first year of another seven year cycle, eight years, and to the first of the next seven year cycle, fifteen years, said Rubin, it was in the fourteenth year after the year in which the city was smitten, but how? Then in the twenty fifth year, it was really in the twenty sixth year, for a master said they were exiled in the seventh year, they were exiled in the eighth year, they were exiled in the eighteenth year, they were exiled in the nineteenth year, now from the seventh to the eighteenth are eleven years, add fifteen, and that makes it twenty six years, Rubin will answer you, but even according to your own reckoning, is it right since they were exiled also in the nineteenth year, you have from the seventh? To the nineteenth, twelve years, add fourteen years, and you have twenty-six years. What you must therefore say is that the counting excludes the year in which they were exiled. So is it with me? The counting excludes the year in which they were exiled. But at any rate, the number nineteen remains a difficulty according to Rabbanu. Do you think three exiles are involved? No, rather they were exiled in the seventh year after the subjection of Jehoiakim, which happened to be the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar. They were exiled in the eighteenth year after the conquest of Jehoiakim, which was the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. For a master has taught in the first year he Nebuchadnezzar conquered Nineveh Talmud, Masarak and B. In the second he came up and conquered Jehoiakim. The same happened with the second destruction of the temple. But how is it possible that the second time it happened at the end of a septennate? For how long did the second temple stand? Four hundred and twenty. Years now 400 years correspond to eight cycles of jubilees 14 years would make two septenates leaving six years over hence it the second destruction should have happened in the sixth year of the septenate this is in accord with Arjuna who says that the fiftieth year is counted both ways take the eight years of the eight jubilee cycles add to them those six years which will amount to 
into an urn thereupon came Jitta and took six for his own portion and for that of his fellows Talmud, Masarakan then came Haram and took six for his own portion and for that of his fellows thus also Pasher and Amr then the prophets who were among them regulated that even if Jehoiarab the head of the guards were to come up he could not push Jitta from his place but Jitta would remain the chief and Jehoiarab only an adjunct to him hence the statement refers only to the remaining. Details are as she said he does not count the six years until Ezra had come up and dedicated the sanctuary for it is written and ceased the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem and it is also written and this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king and it had taught about the same time in the following year Ezra with his exiled community went up to the land as it is said and he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month which was in the seventh year of the king to revert to the main text seventeen jubilee cycles did Israel count from the time they entered the land until they left it but you cannot say that they counted from the moment they entered for if you were to say so then it would be found that the temple was destroyed at the beginning of a seven year cycle and you could not account for in the fourteenth year after that the city was smitten etc once do we know that it took seven years to Conquer the land Caleb said forty years old was I when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land and now lo I am this day fourscore and five years old and the master said the first year Moses built the tabernacle in the second the tabernacle was put up then he sent out the spies when Caleb passed over the Jordan how old therefore was he he was two years less than eighty years old when he distributed the inheritances he said now lo I am this day fourscore and five years old whence it follows that it took seven years for them to conquer the land and whence do we know that it took them seven years to distribute it if you like say since the conquest took seven years so did the distribution or if you like say because otherwise one could not account for in the fourteenth year after that the city was smitten Mishnah there were never less than six inspected lambs in the cell of lambs sufficient for a Sabbath and the two festival days of the new year. And their number could be increased into infinity. There were never less than two trumpets, and their number could be increased into infinity. There were never less than nine lyres, and their number could be increased into infinity. But there was only one symbol tomorrow. But the continual and the additional sacrifices were larger in number. The tanner refers to average days, and only to continual daily offerings as for sufficient for a Sabbath and the two festival days of the new year that is to serve. Only as a mnemotechnical note, and this is what he says: there were never less than six inspected Talmud, Masarak, and B lambs in the cell of lambs, having thus been inspected four days before they were actually slaughtered. Whose view is this that of Ben Bag Bag? For it was taught Ben Bag Bag said, "Once do we know that the lamb destined for the continual daily offering requires to be inspected four days before the slaughtering?" The text states, "Shall ye observe Tishru to offer unto me?" In. It's due season and there it is said and ye shall keep it Elimish Merith until the fourteenth day of the same month just as there it was required that it the animal be inspected four days before the slaughtering so here too is it required that it be examined four days before the slaughtering that may also be inferred from the wording sufficient for a Sabbath not for a Sabbath that inference is conclusive never less than two trumpets and their number could be increased into infinity how far. Arhuna Zabdi or according to others are Zabdi said in the name of Arhuna up to one hundred and twenty and it is said and with them hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets never less than nine liars but only one symbol once do we know that Arashi said scripture said and Azaf with symbol sounding aloud but symbols implies two since they both perform one function and are played by one man he the tana called them one Mishnah there were never less than twelve Elivial standing. On the platform and their number could be increased into infinity no minor could enter the court of the sanctuary to take part in the service except when the Levites stood up to sing nor did they join in the singing with harp and lyre but with the mouth alone to add flavor to the music our Eliezer B. Jacob said they did not help to make up the required number nor did they stand on the platform but they would stand on the ground so that their heads were between the feet of the Levites and they would be called the tormentors of the Levites Gemara to whom did these correspond to the nine liars two harps and the one symbol as it is said he and his brethren and sons were twelve no minor could enter the court of the sanctuary etc once do we know that our Yohanan said because scripture said and stood with his sons and his brethren and Cadmiel and his sons the sons of Judah together to have the oversight of the workmen in the house of God nor did they join in the singing with the Harp and lyre, but with the mouth alone, etc. One would say, therefore, that harp and lyre are different instruments. Is this to say that our mission is not in accord with our Judah? For it was taught, our Judah said, the harp of the sanctuary had seven chords, as it is written in that presence. Is fitness of joy read, not fullness of but seven sheep of the harp of the messianic days has eight chords, as it is said. For the leader on the Sheminith, i.e., the eighth string, the harp of the world to come has ten chords, as it is said, with an instrument of ten strings and with the psaltery with a solemn sound upon the harp. Furthermore, it is said, give thanks unto the Lord with harp, sing praises unto him with the psaltery of ten strings, sing unto him a new song, play skillfully midst shouts of joy. You could say also that our mission will be in accord with our Judah, since in the world to come it will have more chords and its sound will be stronger, like that of a harp. He calls it harp, our Eliza B. Jacob said. They did not help to make up the required number, etc. A tana taught they were called assistants to the Levites. Our tana, however, called them tormentors of the Levites because their voice was high, the voice of the others low, they could sing high, whereas the others could not do so. C H A P T E R I I mission. The law of valuation is at times in the direction of leniency, at others in the direction of stringency. The law of the field of possession is at times more lenient, at others more stringent. The law concerning a mute ox that has killed a slave is at times more lenient, at others more stringent. The law of the violator and seducer and of him that hath brought up an evil name is at times more lenient, at others more stringent. The law of valuation is at times more lenient, at others more stringent. How is that it is all one whether a man has evaluated the fairest in Israel or the ugliest in Israel, he must pay fifty sellers, but if he said I value his worth, he need pay but as much as he is worth. There tomorrow the law of valuation is at times more lenient at others more stringent etc. How is that it is all one whether a man has evaluated etc. only in Israel but not in the case of an idolater shall we say that our mission will not be in accord with our mayor for it was taught concerning an idolater our mayor said he may be made the subject of valuation but he may not evaluate you may say also that it is in accord with our mayor and that the same law would apply to idolaters but Talmud, Masarakan. A. Our mission informs us incidentally of a teaching in accord with Rab Judah who said in the name of Rab one should not say how beautiful is this Canaanite then let it teach whether a man has dedicated the fairest in Israel or the ugliest among Canaanites it deals with one nation not with two nations but does it not surely it teaches of the noblest among the priests and the humblest in Israel there it is one nation except that the priests are holier and if you like say since it is about to Teach in the second part of the mission concerning a field of possession which applies only to Israel, not to idolaters, because they do not possess fields by inheritance in the land. Therefore, it teaches also in the first part of the mission with reference to Israel alone. Mission the law of the field of possession is at times more lenient at others more stringent. How is that it is all one whether a man dedicates a field in the sandy plain of Mahas or in the gardens of Sebast if he would redeem it, he must pay fifty shekels of silver for every part of the field sufficient for the sowing of a homer of barley. But if it was a field which he hath bought, he must pay what it is worth. Our Eliezer says it is all the same whether it be a field of possession or one that he hath bought. The only difference between the field of possession and that which he hath bought lies therein for a field of possession he must pay the added fifth, whereas for a field that he hath bought he need not pay. The added fifth Gemara Arhuna said if a man had dedicated a field full of trees he must when he comes to redeem them redeem the trees for what they are worth and then redeem the ground at the rate of fifty shekels of silver for every part of the field sufficient for the sowing of a homer of barley we see thus that Arhuna holds one who dedicated dedicates with a generous I Arnam and raised the following objection to Arhuna it is all one whether a man dedicates a field in the sandy plain of Mahas or in the gardens of Sebast he must pay fifty shekels of silver for every part of the field sufficient for the sowing of a homer of barley he answered he the means such as are fit to be gardens he raised a further objection field for
redeems and then must redeem again but surely since the second clause expressly mentions he must redeem and redeem again it follows that in the first clause this is not so rather say according to whom is this teaching it is in accord with our Simeon who holds that one who dedicates does so with an ungenerous eye for it was taught if one dedicates a field he dedicates the whole of it our Simeon says he does not dedicate anything together with the field save the full-grown carob tree and it Crop sycamore tree if this be in accord with our Simeon consider the second part and not only that but if he dedicates the trees and afterwards the ground when he comes to redeem he must redeem the trees at their value and then must redeem the ground again at the rate of fifty shekels of silver for every part of the field sufficient for the sowing of a homer of barley now if it were in accord with our Simeon one should be guided only by the circumstances at the time of redemption and hence they should be redeemed automatically with the ground for we have heard from our Simeon to be guided by circumstances at the time of redemption for it was taught once do we know that if one buys a field from his father and dedicates it and the father died afterwards that that field is considered a field of possession because the text states and if he sanctify unto the Lord a field which he hath bought which is not of the field of his possession i.e. a field which could not become a field of Possession that excludes such a field as this which would have become his field of possession. This is the view of our Judah and our Simeon. Our Meir said, Whence do we know that if one buys a field from his father and his father died and he thereupon dedicated it, that it is considered a field of possession? Talmud, Masarak, and B, because the text states, And if he sanctify unto the Lord a field which he hath bought, which is not the field of his possession, i.e., a field which is not a field of possession, excluding one that is his field of possession. Now, according to our Judah and our Simeon, even if he dedicated it and his father died subsequently, it is still considered a field of possession. What is the reason, therefore, it is on account of the scriptural text, but that is in favor of our Meir's view. Rather, must you say, because one is guided by the circumstances that the redeeming said, Our Naman B, Isaac, our Judah and our Simeon found a scriptural verse and expounded it, if it were so, as our Meir holds it. Divine law should have written if he sanctify a field which he hath bought which is not his possession but since it says which is not of the field of his possession it means a field which is not fit to be the field of his possession our papa said if one dedicates stony ground he must redeem it at its value why the divine law speaks of a field for the sowing and this ground cannot be sown if he has not redeemed it then in the jubilee year it goes forth to the priests why because the divine law speaks of a field no matter of what kind if he sold stony ground it can be redeemed even within two years why according to the number of the years of the crops says the divine law and its stony ground is incapable of having crops if he has not redeemed it it returns in the jubilee year to the owners why and he shall return into his possession the divine law says and this to his possession if he dedicates trees he redeems them at their worth what is the reason the divine law says a field for sowing but not trees if he did not redeem them they do not go forth in the jubilee year to the priest what is the reason the divine law says and the field shall be but not trees if he sold trees they are not redeemed before two years what is the reason according to the number of the years of the crops says the divine law and these are productive of crops if he has not redeemed them they do not return to the owner at jubilee what is the reason and he shall return unto his possession says the divine law but not trees the master said if he dedicates trees he redeems them at their worth etc but why let them become sacred property through the ground and be redeemed together with it and return to their owners at jubilee together with the ground and if you were to argue he dedicated trees but not ground but did not the knee and say if one sells to his neighbor a date palm the latter acquires it from the base to the furthest depth but it was taught in connection therewith only if he came with such a claim but if it was a field which he had bought he must pay what it is actually worth our rabbis taught the worth what does that teach us since it is said fifty shekels of silver for every piece of the field sufficient for the sowing of a homer of barley I might have thought the same applied also to a field which he bought therefore the text states the worth our Eliezer says here it is said the priest shall reckon and above it is said the priest shall reckon just as there are definite sum so here also a definite sum the following question was asked do the rabbis accept this kazurish and hence they infer also the additional fifth or do they not accept this kazurish and neither the fifth said rabbi it seems logical that they do not accept this kazurish for the divine law revealed taught concerning the fifth both in connection with the field of possession and also with one who dedicated his house we have thus two scriptural verses teaching the same thing and whenever two scriptural verses teach the same thing they do not serve as illustrations for other cases but what according to him who says they do serve as illustrations for other cases since the divine law revealed about a fifth in connection with the tithe of pure and impure cattle it is a teaching occurring frequently and hence they do not serve as illustrations in other cases it was taught in accord with Rabba but not for the reason he advanced it was taught it worth of valuation here with scripture compares it to valuation just as no fifth is added in connection with valuation so no fifth is added in connection with the field that he has bought mission of the law concerning a mu ox that has killed a slave is at times in the direction of leniency at others in the direction of stringency how is that it is all one whether it killed the finest slave or the ugliest slave he must pay thirty cells if it killed a free man he must pay what he is worth if it Wounded him whether the one or the other he must pay the damage in full tomorrow this then applies only to a muad but not to a tam shall we say that our mission will not be in accord with our akiba for it was taught our akiba said even with the tam which injured a man the larger damage must be paid in full you can even say that it is in accord with our akiba for it applies to a tam too but since he wishes to teach in the latter part the case where it killed a slave or a free man which applies only to a muad but not to a tam therefore it speaks of muad mission the law of the violator and seducer is at times in the direction of leniency at others in the direction of stringency how is that it is all one whether a man violated or seduced a woman from among the noblest of the priestly stock or the humblest in Israel he must pay fifty cells but compensation for shaming and for blemish is in accord with the circumstances of him who shames and of her who suffers that shame tomorrow but why perhaps the divine law means fifty cells for all the things together. Our Zeira replied, People would say, How should one who has lain with the king's daughter pay fifty, and one who has lain with the daughter of a commoner pay fifty? Abe replied to him, If that be right, one could argue in the case of a slave to wife or a slave who perforates pearls thirty, and for one who does needlework also thirty. Rather said, Our Zeira Talmud, Masarak and A argue thus if two men had intercourse with her, the one in a natural way, the other in an unnatural manner, people will say, He who has lain with a blemished woman pays fifty, and he who has lain with a sound woman fifty said, Abe to him, but with regard to a slave, they would equally say, For the death of a healthy slave thirty, and for one afflicted with boils also thirty. Rather said, Abe, this is his answer. Scripture said, Because he hath humbled her from this, it is evident that there is also indemnification for shame and blemish. Rabba said, Since Scripture said, and the man that lay with her shall give it indicates that for the enjoyment of lying with her he must pay fifty shekels, from which we infer that there are other things to pay for this shame and blemish mission of the law of him that hath brought up an evil name is at times in the direction of leniency at others in the direction of stringency. How is that it is all one whether a man hath brought up an evil name against a woman from the noblest of priestly stock or of the humblest? In Israel he must pay a hundred cells, thus it is found that he who speaks with his mouth suffers more than he that commits an act. Thus we do also find that the judgment against our fathers in the wilderness was sealed only because of their evil tongue, as it is written, yet have put me to proof these ten times, etc. Gamara, once do we know that perhaps it is due to the fact that he wanted to bring about her death as it is written, but if this thing be true, then they shall bring out the damsel. And stoned her with stones that she die. Rabbah answered scripture said because he hath brought up an evil name i.e. only because of the evil name that he has brought up thus do we also find that the judgment etc. Once do we know that perhaps it was due to the fact that their measure of guilt was not full yet for our Hamnana said the Holy One blessed be he does not punish man until his measure is full as it is said in the fullness of his sufficiency he shall be in straits Resh Lakish replied. Scripture said yet have put me to proof these ten times i.e. because of these was the judgment against them sealed and was taught our Eliezer B. Parada said come and see how great the power of an evil tongue is once do we know its power from the spies for if it happens thus to those who bring up an evil report against wood and stones how much more will it happen to him who brings up an evil report against his neigh
Generation were among those of little faith as Rabbi Bimari expressed it for Rabbi Bimari said it is written but they were rebellions at the sea even at the Red Sea nevertheless he saved them for his namesake this teaches that Israel were rebellious at that very hour saying just as we go up from this side so will the Egyptians go up from the other side the Holy One blessed be he said to the prince of the sea cast them out on the dry land he answered sovereign of the universe is there a slave to whom his master gives a gift and then takes it away from him again he said to him I shall give you afterwards one and a half times as many of them he said before him sovereign of the universe is there any slave who can claim anything against his master he said the brook of Kishon shall be surety and once he cast them on the dry land as it is written and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore twice because of water at Merah and at Rephidim at Merah as it is written and when they came to Merah they could not drink and it is written and the people murmured against Moses at Rephidim as it is written they encamped in Rephidim and there was no water to drink and it is also written wherefore the people strove with Moses twice because of the manna as it is written Talmud, Masarak and B do not go out whereas they did go out do not leave over but they did leave over twice because of the quails of the first and second quails with the first when we sat by the flesh pots with it. Second quails and the mixed multitude that was among them with the golden calf as it happened in the wilderness of Paran as it happened are Yohanan said in the name of our Joseph Bezimur what is the meaning of what shall be given unto thee and what shall be done more unto thee thou deceitful tongue the holy one blessed be he said to the tongue all members of the human body are standing you are lying all members of the human body are outside you are guarded inside not only that but I surrounded you with two walls one of bone and one of flesh what shall be given unto thee what shall be done more unto thee thou deceitful tongue and are Yohanan said in the name of our Joseph Bezimur one who bears evil tales almost denies the foundation of faith as it is said who have said our tongue will we make mighty our lips are with us who is lord over us further did our Yohanan say in the name of our Joseph Bezimur anyone who bears evil tales will be visited by the plague of leprosy as it is said who so Slandereth his neighbor in secret him his myth will I destroy and there it is said lazimeth in perpetuity which we translate as absolutely permanently and we learn the leper that is shut up differs from the leper that is certified unclean only in respect of unkempt hair and rent garments Reshlakish said what is the meaning of this shall be the law of the leper it means this shall be the law for him who brings up an evil name further said Reshlakish what is the meaning of it scriptural verse if the serpent bite before it is charmed and the charmer hath no advantage at some future time all the animals will assemble and come to the serpent and say the lion attacks and devours the wolf tears and consumes but what profit hast thou but he will answer what benefit has he who uses his tongue further said Reshlakish one who slanders makes his sin reach unto heaven as it is said they have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth are his da said in the name of Marakba one who slanders deserves to be stoned with stones it is written here him his myth will I destroy and it is written there Zamathu they have cut off my life in the dungeon and have cast stones upon me further did our his da say in the name of Marakba of him who slanders the holy one blessed be he says he and I cannot live together in the world as it is said whoso slandereth his neighbor in secret him will I destroy whoso is haughty of eye and proud of heart him will I not suffer do not read though him will I not suffer but it oh with him can I not suffer to be together some refer this to the arrogant further said our his da in the name of Marakba about one who slanders the holy one blessed be he says to the prince of Gehenim I shall be against him from above you be against him from below and we shall condemn him as it is said sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of broom arrow means nothing else but the evil tongue as it is said their tongue is a sharpened arrow would speak deceit and mighty means only the holy one blessed be he as it is said the Lord will go forth as a mighty man and cools of broom is get him our hammer behind it is said what is the remedy for slanderers if he be a scholar let him engage in the Torah as it is said the healing for a tongue is the tree of life and tongue here means the evil tongue as it is said their tongue is a sharpened arrow and tree of life means only the Torah as it is said she is a tree of life too. The med lay hold upon her but if he be an ignorant person let him become humble as it is said but perverseness therein is a wound to the spirit our Ahabi our Hannah said if he has slandered already there is no remedy for him for King David and his holy spirit has cut him off already as it is said may the Lord cut off all flattering lips the tongue that speak great proud things nevertheless what shall be his remedy so that he may not come to utter evil speech if he be a scholar let him. Engage in the Torah and if he be an ignorant person let him humble himself as it is said but perverseness therein is a wound to the spirit the school of our Ishmael taught whoever speaks slander increases his sins even up to the degree of the three cardinal sins idolatry incest and the shedding of blood it is said here the tongue that speak great things and it is written in connection with idolatry oh this people have sinned a great sin touching incest scripture said how then can I do this great wickedness and in connection with the shedding of blood it is written my punishment is greater than I can bear perhaps great things refers to two sins of the three which of them would you exclude in the West Palestine they say the talk about third persons kills three persons him who tells the slander him who accepts it and him about whom it is told our Hamba Bihanna said what is the meaning of death and life are in the hand power of the tongue has the tongue a hand it tells you that just as the hand can kill so can the tongue one might say that just as the hand can kill only one near it thus also the tongue can kill only one near it therefore the text states their tongue is a sharpened arrow then one might assume that just as an arrow kills only within 40 or 50 cubits thus also the tongue kills only up to 40 or 50 cubits therefore the text states they have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth but since it is written already they set their mouth against the heavens why was it necessary to state also their tongue is a sharpened arrow this is what we are informed that the tongue kills as an arrow but once it is written their tongue is a sharpened arrow why was it necessary to state death and life are in the hand of the tongue it is in accord with Rabba for Rabba said he who wants to live can find life through the tongue he who wants to die can find death through the tongue what constitutes evil Speech Rabbi said for example to say there is fire in the house of so and so said Abbe what did he do he just gave information rather when he utters that in slanderous fashion where else should there be fire if not in the house of so and so there is always meat and fish Rabbi said whatsoever is said in the presence of the person concerned is not considered evil speech said Abbe to him but then it is the more impudence and evil speech he answered I hold with our Jose for our Jose said I have never said a word and look behind my back Talmud Masarak and Rabbi son of Arhuna said whatsoever is said before three is not considered slander while your friend has a friend and your friend's friend has a friend when Ardimi came from Palestine he said what is the meaning of the verse he that blesseth his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning it shall be counted a curse to him it refers for example to the case of one who happened to stay in a house where they labored much on his behalf and next morning he goes out into the street and says may the merciful one bless so and so who labored so much on my behalf whereupon people will hear it and come and plunder him our brother of our saffra learned let no man ever talk in praise of his neighbor for through talking in his praise he will come to disparage him some there are who say our brother of our saffra was ill our saffra entered to inquire about his state of health he said may it come home to me that i have kept whatever the rabbis have enjoined he said to him hast thou also kept their command let no man ever talk in praise of his neighbor for through talking in his praise he will come to disparage him he answered i have not heard it for had i heard it l would have kept it our samuel be he said in the name of our yohan and because of seven things the plague of leprosy is incurred these are slander the shedding of blood vain oath incest arrogance robbery and envy because of slander as it is Written whoso slandereth his neighbor in secret him will I destroy for bloodshed as it is written and let there not fail front the house of Job one hath an issue or that is a leper for a vain oath as it is written and Naaman said be content take two talents and it is written the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee for incest as it is written and the Lord plagued Pharaoh with great plagues because of arrogance as it is written but when he was strong his heart was lifted up. So he did corruptly and he trespassed against the Lord his God and the leprosy broke forth in his forehead because of robbery as it is written and the priest shall command that they empty the house in connection with which it had taught because he had gathered money that was not his own the priest comes and scatters it and because of envy as it is said then he that owneth the house shall
Rogue procures atonement, but our Simeon said in the name of our Joshua be Levi for two things we do not find any atonement through sacrifices, but we do find atonement for them through something else is bloodshed and slander, bloodshed through the heifer whose neck is to be broken and slander through incense for our hand and taught we have learned that the incense procures atonement as it is written and he put all the incense and mode atonement for the people and the school of our Ishmael taught for what? Does incense procure atonement for slander the Holy One blessed be he said let that which is offered in secret come and procure atonement for what was done in secret now we have a contradiction from one teaching concerning bloodshed as against another teaching touching bloodshed and a contradiction from one teaching about slander against another about slander there is no contradiction between the two teachings about bloodshed one speaks of a case where it is known who has killed him and the other where it is unknown but where it is known who has killed him he ought to be executed it speaks of a case where he did it deliberately but without having been forewarned neither is there a contradiction between the two teachings about slander the one was committed in secret Talmud Masarak and be the other in public our Samuel be El Nadab asked of Arhanna or as others say our Samuel be Nadab the son-in-law of Arhanna asked of Arhanna or according to still others asked of our Joshua be Levi wherein is a leper different that the Torah said he shall dwell alone without the camp shall his dwelling be he separated a husband from his wife a man from his neighbor therefore said the Torah he shall dwell alone our Joshua be Levi said wherein is a leper different that the Torah said two living clean birds he should bring so that he may become pure again the Holy One blessed be he said he did the work of a babbler therefore let him offer a babbler as a sacrifice our rabbis taught thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart one might have believed one may only not smite him slap him curse him therefore the text states in thy heart scripture speaks of hatred in the heart once do we know that if a man sees something unseemly in his neighbor he is obliged to reprove him because it is said thou shalt surely rebuke if he rebuked him and he did not accept it once do we know that he must rebuke him again the text states surely rebuke always one might assume this to be Obligatory even though his face blanched therefore the text states thou shalt not bear sin because of him it was taught in a very thar tarfan said I wonder whether there is anyone in this generation who accepts reproof for if one says to him remove the moat from between your eyes he would answer remove the beam from between your eyes or Eliezer B. Ezra I said I wonder if there is one in this generation who knows how to reprove our Yohan and Binuri said I call heaven and earth to witness for myself that often was Akiba punished through me because I used to complain against him before our Rabban Gamaliel Gurubai and all the more he showered love upon me to make true what has been said reprove not a scorner lest he hate the reprove a wise man and he will love the urge the son of our Simeon because he asked of our Simeon because he what is preferable reproof with honest purpose or false modesty he answered won't you agree that true modesty is better for a master said modesty is the greatest of them all thus also is false modesty preferable for Rab Judah said in the name of Rab by all means let a man engage in the study of the Torah and in good deeds even if not for their own sake because through the work for an ulterior purpose he will arrive at the stage of doing good for its own sake what is honest reproof and what is false modesty for instance the case of Arhuna and Haibi Rab who were sitting before Samuel when Haibi Rab said sir look how he is vexing me greatly he are. Huna undertook not to vex him any more after he the former left here Huna said he did this and that unseemly thing whereupon Samuel said why did you not tell him that to his face he replied forbid that the seed of Rab should be put to shame through me how far shall reproof be administered Rab said until he the reprover be beaten Samuel said until he be cursed our Yohan and said until he be rebuked this is a point at issue between Tanay Mar Eliezer said until he be beaten our Joshua said until he be cursed Ben Isa said until he be rebuked said Arnam and be Isaac all the three expounded one scriptural verse it is written and Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan and he said unto him thou son of perverse rebellion do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own shame and unto the shame of thy mother's nakedness and it is written and Saul cast his spear at him to smite him the one who said above until he be beaten said so because it is written to smite him the other who said until he be cursed said so because it is written to thine own shame and to the shame of thy mother's nakedness the other who said until he be rebuked said so because it is written and Saul's anger was kindled but according to him who says until he be shouted at does not scripture mention beating and cursing that was different because for his great love of David Jonathan risked his life even further how far shall a man suffer before changing his lodging rap said until he is beaten Samuel said until they throw his bundles over his shoulder where he himself is beaten there is no dispute that it is proper for him to leave similarly if they threw his bundles over his shoulder there is likewise no dispute they are of conflicting opinion only in case his wife is beaten one holding as long as he himself is not vexed what difference does it make the others view being it will end in a quarrel ultimately why all that deliberation because a master said a Porter constantly changing his lodging discredits others and himself. Our Judah in the name of Rab said once is derived from the Torah the view that a man should not change his lodging because it is said and he went unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Our Jose B. Hanana said it is derived from here and he went on his former journeys. What is the practical difference between them? There is this difference the case of a casual lodging. Our Yohanan said once do we know that a man should not change his occupation and that of his forebears as it is said and King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. He was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in brass. And a master said his mother was of the house of Dan and it is written and I behold I have appointed him with a of the son of a match of the tribe of Dan. At what stage do divine visitations commence? Our Eliezer said if a man had for example a garment woven for him to wear and it does not fit him rather the younger or as others say our zeira or again as others say our samuel be not he demurred to this but more than that was said even if it had been intended to serve him the wine hot and it was served cold to him or it was intended to be served cold and it was served hot to him is accounted as a divine visitation and you say only at that stage mar the son of robin said even if his shirt gets turned inside out rubber or as others say are his daughter again as some say our isaac or as it was said it was taught in the very that even if he puts the hand into his pocket to take out three coins and he takes out but two now this is only in the case where he intended to take out three and took out two but not if he meant to take two and three came into his hand because it is no trouble to throw it back but why all this information because the school of our ishmael taught anyone upon whom forty days have passed without divine visitation had received his world in the West Palestine they say Talmud, Masarak and a retribution is prepared for him and was taught our Eliezer the Great said if the Holy One blessed be he wished to enter in judgment with Abraham Isaac or Jacob not even they could stand before his reproof as it is said now therefore stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord which he did to you and to your fathers it is written such is the generation of them that seek. After him that seek thy face even Jacob, Selah, Arjun, Nisiah and the rabbis differ as to the meaning one says as a leader so the generation the other as the generation so the leader for what practical purpose is this discussion what you say it refers to virtue so that one holds if the generation is virtuous so is the leader the others view being if the leader is virtuous so is the generation but surely there is Zedekiah who was virtuous whereas his generation was not so and there is. Jehoiakim who was not virtuous whilst his generation was so for our Yohan and said in the name of our Simeon Biohe what is the meaning of in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah king of Judah the Holy One blessed be he wanted to reduce the world to formlessness and emptiness because of Jehoiakim but when he considered his generation his anger subsided the Holy One blessed be he wanted to reduce the world to formlessness and emptiness because of the generation of Zedekiah but when he considered Zedekiah his anger subsided rather it refers to anger and gentleness respectively C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-V mission as to the sufficiency of means this shall be done according to the ability of him who bows and when according to the years of his age this shall be according to him who is the subject of the bowels for valuations this shall be according to him who is the subject of the valuation and the valuations shall be paid according to the rate prescribed at the time of it. Valuation as to the sufficiency of means this shall be according to the man who vows how is that if a poor man evaluated a rich man he shall pay only the valuation of the poor man but if a rich man evaluated a poor man he
Only the valuation of the poor man but why scripture said according to the means of him that doubt i.e. the divine law made it dependent upon him who vowed but it is not so with offerings if a man said I take upon myself the offering of this leper and the leper was poor he brings the offering of the poor man this means although he who vowed is rich but did not the divine law say and if he be poor and he who vowed is not poor said our Isaac this refers to the case where he who vowed to was poor but perhaps the all merciful spared only the leper himself but not him who vowed as it is written if he be too poor said our Adabi Ahaba and his means suffice not includes him who vows but if he who vows were a rich man would he indeed have to bring the offering of a rich man if so what means but it is not so with offerings Talmud Masarak and B1 refers to a poor leper when the person who vowed his sacrifice was poor the other to a rich leper when he who vows is poor one might have believed that since he was included he was completely included therefore we are informed that it is not so even as it was taught since we find in case of valuation that a poor man who evaluated a rich man need pay but the valuation of a poor man one might have assumed that the same applied also to this case therefore the text states and if he be poor but according to rabbi who said i say the same applies also with regard to evaluation which shows that we are guided by the liability of the person so that no scriptural verse is necessary to exclude what then does if he be too poor excluded excludes the case of a poor leper whilst he who vowed was rich i might have assumed that since rabbi said we are guided by the liability of the person we shall here to be guided by the liability of the person therefore we are informed that we are not so guided here mission if he was poor and then became rich or rich and then became poor he must pay the valuation of a rich man or judah says even if he was poor and became rich and then again became poor he must pay the valuation of a rich man but it is not so with offerings even if his father was dying whilst a man out and left him ten thousand or if he had a ship on the sea and it brought to him ten thousand the sanctuary has no claim at all on the gemara if he was poor and then became rich etc as it is written according to the means of him that doubt or rich and then became poor etc as it is written according to the means of him that doubt our judah said even if he was poor and became rich and then again became poor etc what is the reason of our judah's view scripture said but if he be too poor for thy valuation i.e. only if he remains in his poor state from the beginning to the end but if that be so consider that if he be too poor would you say here too only if he remains poor from the beginning to the end and if you were to say indeed so have we not learned if a leper offered up part of his offering as a poor man and became rich or as a rich man and became poor all should be guided by what the sin offering was these are the words of our Simeon our Judah says everything should be guided by what he was when he brought the guilt offering and it was taught our Eliezer B. Jacob says all should be guided by what he was when he brought the birds but surely it was said with regard thereto our Judah said in the name of Rab all the three inferred it from one scriptural verse whose means suffice not for that which pertaineth to his cleansing our Simeon holds the reference is to the thing that procures atonement that is the sin offering our Judah holds it is to the thing which renders him fit that is the guilt offering our Eliezer B. Jacob says the thing which causes his cleansing that is the birds but then why is it said if he be too poor according to Rabbi as he explains it and according to the sages as they explain it but then when it is written he being a witness would you hear to say that he must be a fit witness from beginning to end and if you will say indeed so surely it was taught if a man knew testimony to give for another before he became his son-in-law and then became his son-in-law or if he then could hear and now became deaf could see and now became blind was of sound mind then and now became stupid then he is disqualified as witness but if he knew testimony to give for him before he became his son-in-law then became his son-in-law Talmud, Masarakane. And after that his daughter the father-in-law's i.e. his wife died or if he could hear became deaf and now regained his hearing or if he could see lost his sight and now recovered it or was of sound mind lost his mind and now recovered it then he is eligible as witness this is the general rule whosoever was capable at the beginning and again at the end is eligible it is different there because scripture says if he do not utter it then he shall bear his iniquity the divine law has made the matter dependent on seeing and hearing and that is found here but then what is the need of he being a witness because of what has been taught if he saw a company of men standing among whom are his witnesses and he says I adjure you that if you know a testimony on my behalf you come and testify for me one might have assumed that they then are obliged to do so therefore the text states he being a witness whilst he has not singled out his witnesses one might assume that the same applies even if he said whosoever of you knows a fact to testify to etc therefore the text states he being a witness and he has singled them out but it is not so with offerings if his father died and left him ten thousand etc but then he is a rich man our Abu said say he was leaving him ten thousand but that is self-evident it means that his father lies in a dying condition you might have said most of the people in a dying condition really die therefore we are informed that the sanctuary has Nevertheless no claim if his boat is on the sea returning to him with 10,000 but then he is a rich man or his da said it refers to a case when he had rented out or hired it out to others but there is the rent rent is not payable before the end of the contracted period but derive his richness from his boat alone this is in accord with the view of our Eliezer for it was taught if he was a farmer they must leave him his yoke of oxen and if he was an ass driver they must leave him his ass. Mission as for the years this shall be valued according to the age of him who is out if a child evaluates an old man he must pay the valuation of an old man and if an old man evaluates a child he must pay the valuation of a child as for valuation this shall be according to him who is the subject of the valuation how is that if a man evaluated a woman he must pay the valuation of a woman and if a woman evaluated a man she must pay the valuation of a man and the valuation depends upon it. Time of the valuation how is that if he evaluated one who was less than 5 years of age and he became meantime older than 5 years of age or he evaluated one who was less than 20 years of age and he became 20 years old he must pay only in accord with the age at the time of the valuation Gemara our rabbis taught you have compared vows of market value to valuations both with regard to the valuation of pearls for the poor and to the rule that the value of a limb be judged in. Accord with its importance one might have assumed that we shall compare valuations with vows of market value also with regard to the rule that thereto he shall have to pay its value according to the time of the payment therefore it is said according to the valuation it shall stand i.e. in the case of valuation he shall pay only as much as it was worth at the time of the valuation mission the 30th day is accounted under this age the 5th year or 20th year is accounted under this age. For it is written, and if it be from sixty years old and upward, we learned thus with regard to all others from what is said about sixty years, just as the sixtieth year is accounted under this age, so also the fifth and twentieth years are accounted under this age. What because the Torah has reckoned the sixtieth year to be under this age, thereby being more stringent, shall the fifth or the twentieth year be considered under this age, whereby it would be more lenient to teach us that it is said years. Years to set forth this analogy, just as with the sixtieth year, the word years means that it be reckoned under age, so the word years with the fifth and with the twentieth year means that it is to be reckoned under age, no matter whether it bears leniently or stringently. Our Eliezer says this rule holds good until they are a month and a day beyond the years concerned. Tomorrow, now this is superfluous for were that not the case, it could be refuted as we did. For the fact is that the words years, years. Are written superfluously, shall we say that our mission is not in accord with Rabbi? For if it were in accord with Rabbi, surely he said until is meant to be inclusive. For it was taught it is written from the first day until the seventh day. One might have assumed this to mean from the first day on, but the first not included, and until the seventh day, but the seventh day not included. Talmud, Masarak, and B in the same manner as it is said from his head, even unto his feet, where it means from his head on, but his head is not included, and unto his feet, but his feet are not included. Therefore, it is said until the one and twentieth day of the month that even Rabbi said this was not necessary. First itself means the first inclusive, and seventh the seventh inclusive. You might even say that our mission is in accord with Rabbi here. However, the scriptural verses are balanced, for it is written from a month old, even unto five years old. Why then stay from five years old, even unto twenty? Years old, therefore they are balanced. The master has set his head, but his head is not included. His feet, but the feet are not included. Once do we know that if you like say because the signs of leprosy on the body are different from those on the head, or if you like say as far as appeareth to the priest, our Eliezer says this rule holds good until they are a month and a day beyond the years concerned. It was taught our Eliezer said
Sell unto the implying that a man eats the fruit of three crops in two years with regard to the six years of a Hebrew slave scripture said six years he shall serve and in the seventh implying that at times in the seventh year too he may be working as well as those of a son or daughter for what practical purpose is the rule argital in the name of Rab said with regard to valuations are Joseph said with regard to the subject of the chapter on the foe is extracted by means of a caesarean. Section said Abbe to our Joseph are you two of conflicting opinion he replied no I say one thing and he said another thus also does it seem logical for if you should think they are disputing and he who said the practical purpose concerns valuations should not hold it to be also with regard to the chapter about the is extracted by means of a caesarean section has not Rab said that the decision was with regard to all cases in that chapter that the years were to be understood as from Hour to hour then why does he who said the practical purpose concerned valuations not say it concerns the chapter on a caesarean extraction because it is to be analogous to those mentioned previously just as these are written in the Torah so does this refer to what is written in the Torah and the other if you think that the reference is to what is written and the expression with a son or daughter ought it not to state with male or female Talmud, Masarak and a wise a female. When she is old valued only at one third whereas a man at not even a third said Hezekiah people say an old man in the house is a burden in the house an old woman in the house is a treasure in the house C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V Mishnah if a man said I bow my weight then he must pay his weight in silver if he had said in silver or in gold if he had said in gold it happened with the mother of your Mishnah who had said I bow my daughter's weight she went up to Jerusalem and weighed her and then paid her. Weight in gold if a man said I bow the weight of my hand our Judah says let him fill a barrel with water and put it his hand in up to the elbow then let him weigh the flesh bones and sinews of an ass and put it into the barrel until it is filled up again said our Jose but how is it possible to account exactly one kind of flesh against another kind of flesh and one kind of bones against another kind of bones rather one estimates what the hand is likely to weigh tomorrow what does it mean if silver? Silver if gold gold Rab Judah said if he had said my weight in silver then he must pay it in silver if gold gold but that is self evident this is what he is teaching us the reason is because he has mentioned expressly the precious metal but if he has not mentioned expressly he can free himself of the obligation with anything in accord with Reuba for Reuba said in a place where they sell pitch by the weight he can free himself even with pitch but that is self evident no it is. Necessary to mention that for the case that some way and others measure it you might say since not all sell it by weight he may not free himself by paying his weight in pitch therefore we are informed that he may our papa said in a place where they sell onions by the weight he can acquit himself of his vow even with onions but that is self-evident it is necessary to mention that because after weighing it the seller would add two or three therefore you might have said thereby it should be excluded from the rule of things sold by weight therefore we are informed that it is not so excluded it happened with the mother of your an accident is reported to contradict the law just stated something is missing here and thus it ought to read but if it be a prominent person then although he has not expressly stated we estimate it in accordance with his dignity and it happened with the mother of your who had said I bow my daughter's weight she went up to Jerusalem. And they weighed her and then she paid her weight in gold. Rab Judah said if one says I bow my stature he must give a staff which cannot be bent. If he said I bow my full stature he may give a staff which can be bent. They raised the following objection if one said I bow my stature or if he said I bow my full stature he must give a staff which cannot be bent. He holds with our Akiva who pays close attention to redundant speech for we learned nor has he thereby sold the cistern or the walled seller even though he wrote in the document of sale the depth and the height but he the seller must acquire for himself a way thereto. These are the words of our Akiva the rabbis taught he does not need to do so. Our Akiva however agrees that if he had said with the exception of these he need not buy himself a way thereto. Thus we see that since he did not have to say anything and nevertheless did make a statement he meant to add something thereby therefore here too since he did not have to say. Anything and he spoke nevertheless he wanted to add something the following question was raised in the academy if he said my stand what is the law Talmud, Masarak and be my breath what is the law my sitting or my thickness what is the law my circumference what is the law the questions remain unanswered I bow the weight of my hand our rabbis taught if one said I bow the weight of my hand and the weight of my foot our Judah says let him bring a barrel fill it with water place his hand therein up to the elbow and his foot up to the knee then let him weigh the flesh bones and sinews of an ass and put it into the barrel until it is filled up and although there is no proof for it in the bible there is a mnemonic illusion whose flesh is as the flesh of asses our Jose said to him how is it possible to account exactly one kind of flesh as against another kind of flesh one kind of bones as against another kind of bones and one kind of sinews as against another kind of sinews are Judah answered him they estimate the weight of the flesh bones and sinews said our Jose to him if you must estimate estimate the hand itself and our Judah as far as possible we do it by weight the hand up to the elbow and objection was raised the hands and feet in the sanctuary were washed up to the joint of the palm in the language of the Torah hand means up to the joint but with regard to vows go after human parlance but according to the Torah language does it mean up to the joint what? Then of Tefillin with regard to which thy hand is written and the school of Menes taught thy hand that means on the biceps muscle rather say thus in the Torah it means the whole biceps muscle but with regard to vows go after human parlance and as to washing the hands and feet in the sanctuary that is a traditional teaching the foot up to the knee but there is a contradiction against this it is written feet that excludes people with wooden legs with regard to vows go after human. Parlance, but in the Torah, does the term foot exclude people with wooden legs? What of Eliza, where it is written his foot, and yet it was taught if she drew off his shoe that was strapped from the knee below her, Eliza ceremony is valid. It is different there because scripture says from off his foot, if that be so, then even if the shoe was strapped above the knee, it should also be valid. It reads from above, not from over above. Our Papa said it is evident therefrom that what is called Istara goes down to the ground, for if you should think it is divided into two, then the Istara would be above the foot and the thigh over above the foot. Our Ashi said you may even say that it is divided into two, yet whatsoever is horizontally with the foot is like the foot mission. If someone said, I bow the worth of my hand, they estimate his worth with his hand, and what it would be without his hand in this respect, vows of worth are more stringent than valuations. Gamara, how do we? Estimate him, Rabba said. We estimate him as one estimates in the case of injury. Said Abay are the two cases alike. There, the man is reduced in value. Here, he is in physical integrity. Rather, said Abay, they estimate how much a man would give for a slave who does his work with but one hand as against what he would give for a slave who does his work with both hands. You say with one hand, what does that imply that the other is cut off? But that is the very case of damage just mentioned. Rather, say how much a man would give as against the case where one of his hands is assigned to the first master. Rabba asked if they have estimated him in the case of injury, and he said, I found my worth. What is the law? Do we say surely they have estimated him once already, or is an estimate by ten different from an estimate by three? And if you find a reason for saying that the estimate by ten is different from one by three, what is the law? If he said, I found my worth, and he was estimated, whereupon he said. Again, I bow my worth is it here definite since ten have estimated him, or perhaps he may have increased in value meantime. And if you were to say that he has increased in value meantime, what is the law if he said I bow my worth and they did not estimate him? And then he again said I bow my worth. Do we say in this case he is surely Talmud, Masarak and A to be estimated once only, or perhaps since he bowed one time after the other he is formally to be estimated twice? And if you find a reason for saying that because he bowed one time after the other he is to be estimated twice, what is the law if he said twice my worth? Do I bow? Do we say he has definitely bowed only once and hence he should be estimated only once, or perhaps since he said twice it is to be as if he had bowed one time after the other? And if you find a reason for saying that since he said twice it is to be as if he had bowed one time after the other, what is the law if they had estimated him incidentally? Do we say behold he stands estimated or do we require intention for an estimation to be valid solve at least one of these questions for we learned if one said I bow my worth and die the ears need not give anything because a dead man has no worth now if you were to say that if they had estimated him incidentally the estimate would be considered valid then he too stands estimated already for is there a person who is not worth for zoos at least
Then Bows of valuations for Bows of worth apply to cattle game and birds and are not estimated according to sufficiency of means whereas it is not so with valuations valuations are in the direction of greater stringency than Bows of worth how is that if one said I bow my valuation and then die his heirs must pay it but if he said I bow my worth and then die his heirs need not give anything for dead persons have no worth market value if he said I bow my valuation and then die his heirs must pay we infer therefrom that an oral debt may be collected from the ears it is different here because it is a debt arising from the law of the Torah then we may infer from here that a debt arising from the law of the Torah has the force of one acknowledged in a document of indebtedness here we speak of a case where he stood before the court and in the same situation where he had said I bow my worth if he stood before the court why should the ears not have to pay because in the case of where he says I bow my worth he still lacked estimate whilst in the case where he had said I bow my valuation he lacked nothing I bow the valuation of my hand or of my foot etc argital in the name of Rab said and he must pay its worth market value but it was said he has said nothing he has said nothing according to the rabbis but he must pay according to our measure but he argital has said that once already for argital had said in the name of Rab if someone said I bow the valuation of this vessel he must pay its market value you might have said there he must pay the market value because a man knows that a vessel is not subject to valuation therefore he had made up his mind to use the phrase meaning however it's worth but here he was really mistaken in that he believed that just as there is valuation to my hand or liver there is one to my foot or hand but he never meant the market value therefore he informs us that he must pay the market value nevertheless the valuation of my head or my liver he must pay his whole valuation why the divine law said souls this is the general rule whenever he bowed the valuation of anything on which his life depends he must pay his valuation in full that includes his saying I bow the valuation of anything from the knee upwards half of my valuation etc our rabbis taught if a man said I bow half my valuation he must pay half his valuation our Jose son of our Judah says he receives punishment and must pay his full valuation why should he be punished said our papa he receives the punishment of having to pay the full valuation what is the reason it means we are stringent about the vow half of my valuation because of its possible confusion with the valuation of one half of him and the valuation of the half of oneself is tantamount to the valuation of something on which one's life depends half of my worth do I bow etc but if he said I bow the worth of one half of me he must pay the whole of his worth what is it Reason scripture said of how a person's souls according to thy valuation this is the general rule whenever he vowed the valuation of anything on which life depends he must pay his whole valuation that includes his vowing the worth of anything from the knee upwards our rabbis taught if one vows half the valuation of a vessel then our mayor says he must pay its market value whereas the sages say he need not pay anything rabbi was Ill, and the rabbis entered his home they were sitting and saying that is right according to our mayor for he holds that no man utters his words in vain without purpose there being no difference whether one half or the whole is concerned but the difficulty is with the rabbis what is their view if they hold a man does utter his words in vain then he should be free from any obligation to pay even if he said I vow the valuation of a whole vessel and if they hold that a man does not utter his words in vain then he ought to pay even though he vowed Half of its valuation Rabbi answered them the rabbis here hold with our Meir and with our Simeon they hold with our Meir that no man utters his words in vain and they agree with our Simeon who said that he is exempt because he did not make a free will offering in the manner proper to those that make free will offerings now it would make a full gift for one to bow a whole vessel but it is not usual to bow only half a vessel if someone said I bow the valuation of so and so and then the bower died. Etc. How is this case to be explained presumably that he stood before the court but that is the same as the other it is necessary to state that because of the second clause if he said I bow the worth of so and so and he who bowed died then the ears must pay it Talmud, Masarak and B. Now you might have said since there has been no estimate his possessions are not subject to payment therefore we are informed that since he stood before the court his possessions have automatically Become liable for the bow the estimating being a mere statement of fact as to the monetary value mission if someone said this ox shall be a burnt offering or this house shall be an offering and the ox died or the house fell down he is free from paying their worth but if he said I bow this ox as a burnt offering or this house as an offering and the ox died or the house fell down then he is obliged to pay their worth Gemara our high Rab said this has been taught only for the case where he said I bow the worth of this ox for a burnt offering but if he said I bow this ox as a burnt offering since he had said this and this one died he is not obliged to make restitution for it for he merely meant I bow to bring him an objection was raised if he said this ox shall be a burnt offering then the ox is sacred property and the law of sacrilege applies to it if it die or be stolen he is not obliged to make restitution but if he said I bow this ox as a burnt offering the ox becomes sacred property and the law of sacrilege applies to it if it died or is stolen he is obliged to make restitution is this teaching any stronger than our mission there we assumed it refers to the case where he said I bow its worth thus here too the reference is to the case where he said I bow its worth but since the second part speaks of the case where he said the worth the first must need speak of the case where he did not say the worth for the second part reads if he said the money of the ox shall be a burnt offering then the ox remains profane and the law of sacrilege does not apply to it if it die or be stolen he is not obliged to make restitution but he is obliged to make restitution for his money both the first and the second part speak of the case where he said its money value but in the first case he said the ox be sanctified in respect of its money in the second he said the money thereof be sanctified when realized but how can a man sanctify a thing that is not existent said Rab Judah in the name of Rab this is in accord with our Meir who said a man may sanctify a thing that is not existent some say our Papa said to Abbe or according to others Rabbi Bihama said to our Hista according to whom will this teaching be according to our Meir who holds a man may consecrate a thing that is not existent he replied according to whom else will it be some refer it to the following if a man rents a house to his neighbor and it became leprous then although the priest has declared it definitely leprous he could say to him behold before you lies your own if the priest has broken it down he is obliged to place another one at his disposal Talmud Masarak and if he consecrated it then he who dwells therein must pay rent to the sanctuary it says if he consecrated it then he who dwells therein must pay the rent to the sanctuary but how could he have consecrated it does not the divine law say and when a man shall sanctify his house he just as his house is in his possession so can he sanctify only such things as are in his possession this is what it means if he who leases it consecrates it then he who dwells therein must pay rent to the sanctuary you say if he who leases it consecrated it but how could he dwell therein surely he is committing sacrilege furthermore it says he must pay rent to the sanctuary once sacrilege has been committed its rent becomes profane it speaks of the case where he said as soon as the rent comes in it shall be sanctified but no man can sanctify anything that is not existent that is in accord with our mayor who said a man may sanctify a thing that is not existent some say our papa said to Abbe others that it was Rabbi Bihama said to our Hista according to whom will this teaching be according to our mayor who said a man may sanctify a thing that is not existent he replied according to whom else will it be Mishnah a pledge is to be taken from those who owe money due from valuations but not from those who owe sin offerings or guilt offerings a pledge must be taken from those who owe burnt offerings or peace offerings and although no atonement is obtained for him until he agrees as it is said learns and oh he is to be coerced until he says I agree thus also is it the case with a document of divorce they coerce him until he says I agree tomorrow our papa said it may happen that a pledge is taken from those who owe sin offerings and that none is taken from those who owe burnt offerings a pledge is taken of those who owe a sin offering that is in the case of a Nazi right for since a master said if he shaved his hair after having offered one of the three sacrifices do he has fulfilled his duty and if the blood of one of them has been sprinkled he is permitted to drink wine and to defile himself with a dead person therefore he might be negligent about it and not bring it therefore one compels him to do so no pledge is taken from those who owe burnt offerings this refers to the burnt offerings due from a woman who has given birth why is that presumably because scripture cites it first but did not Rabbi say it is only in the reading in the text that scripture has placed it first but not in respect of the offering itself rather it refers to the burnt offering due from a leper for it was taught our Yohan and Bibarakah said just as his sin offering and his guilt offering are ind
Without his knowledge and agreement he has not fulfilled it if he said I vow the burnt offering or peace offering of so and so then he has fulfilled his obligation whether it was done with his knowledge or not Samuel will answer you this was taught with regard to the time of the obtainment of atonement he having agreed at the time the sacrifice was designated separated for his purpose whereas I refer to his agreement necessary at the time of its being separated now this is in conflict with the view of Olaf Rola said they have made no distinction between burnt offering and sin offering except in this the sin offering requires the agreement of the one who has to bring it at the time of its designation whereas the burnt offering needs no such agreement but as for the time of the atonement in the case of either if with his agreement he has fulfilled his duty if not with his agreement he has not fulfilled his duty an objection was raised if he says I vow it. Sign offering, guilt offering, burnt offering, or peace offering due from so and so. Then, if they are offered with the latter's agreement, he has fulfilled his obligation. Without the latter's agreement, he has not done so. Samuel refers this teaching to the time of the designation. Knowledge that of the atonement. Our Papa said the two barithas do not contradict one another. One refers to the time of the atonement, the other to that of the designation. Nor do they contradict the Amram. Samuel interpreting the first as referring to the time of the atonement, and the second as dealing with the time of the designation. Whereas Ola interprets them inversely. The Amram, however, surely differ, but that is self-evident. You might have said when Samuel says that he refers it to the time of the designation, he means also to the time of the designation. Although thereby the first baritha would be contradicting him. Therefore, we are informed otherwise. Thus, also is it the case with the document of divorce one. Coerces him, etc. Arshis hate said if one utters a protest with regard to a document of divorce, then his protest is valid. Is not that self-evident? No, it is necessary to state that for the case where he was first coerced and then agreed thereto, you might have said he has by his agreement cancelled his protest. Therefore, we are informed his protest stands for if it were not so, let the Mishnah state one coerces him until he gives it what is the meaning of until he says hence it means until he cancels his protest expressly. C H A P T E R B I Mishnah the property of orphans which has been valued must be proclaimed for thirty days and the property of the sanctuary which has been valued for sixty days. The proclamation must be made in the morning and in the evening tomorrow. Why in the morning and in the evening? Rab Judah said in the name of Rab at the time when the laborers leave work and at the time when they enter upon their work at the time when the laborers leave for. There may be someone desirous of buying who would say to them go and examine it for me at the time when they enter upon their work so that he may remind himself of what he had told them and ask them thus was it also taught the property of orphans which has been valued must be proclaimed for thirty days that of the sanctuary for sixty days the proclamation to be made in the morning and in the evening at the time when the laborers leave and at the time when they enter the proclaimer says the field of so and so of these characteristics and boundaries is of such and such quality and is valued at so much let whosoever wants to buy it come and buy it for the purpose of paying a woman her ketuba or a creditor his debt why is it necessary to state for the purpose of paying a woman her ketuba or a creditor his debt because there are some who would prefer dealing with a creditor who is lenient with regard to the coins while others prefer dealing with a woman who will take it also in installments Talmud, Masarak and our rabbis taught the property of orphans which has been valued must be proclaimed for 30 days and that of the sanctuary which has been valued for 60 days. This is the view of our Meir Arjuda says the property of orphans that has been valued must be proclaimed for 60 days and that of the sanctuary which has been valued for 90 days. But the sages say both of them for 60 days are his said in the name of Abami the Halachai is the property of orphans that has been valued must be proclaimed for 60 days. Our high Abin sat and reported this law said Arnaman B. Isaac to him did you say 60 or 30? He replied 60 of the orphans or of the sanctuary. He answered of the orphans in accord with our Meir or with Arjuda. He replied with our Meir but our Meir said 30 days. He answered thus did Arhisda say many obedient did I receive from Abami because of this teaching if he is to proclaim on consecutive days then it Period of proclamation is 30 days if on Mondays and Thursdays alone then it is 60 days and although if you sir were to count the days of actual proclamation it will be only 18 still since the matter is drawn out over 60 days people hear about it Rab Judah said in the name of RC one must not dis tearing upon the property of orphans except if interest was consuming it or Yohanan says either because of a document of indebtedness bearing interest or because of a kethub of a woman so as to save from further payment on account of her why does not RC say because of a woman's kethub because the rabbis have arranged for them to receive the work of her hands and the other at times that may not be sufficient we learned the property of orphans which has been valued must be proclaimed for 30 days and the property of the sanctuary which has been valued for 60 days the proclamation must be made in the morning and in the evening what case are we Dealing with what you say one with a heathen creditor would he agree to wait hence it is self-evident that we are dealing with a case of an Israelite creditor but then if he were to consume interest would we permit him to do so rather must you say that he is not consuming interest and yet it is taught we dis tearing upon the orphan's property now this will be right in accord with our Yohanan who will interpret it as referring to the case of a woman's kethubal but according to RC it is a difficulty RC will answer you but even according to our Yohanan is it in order how do we continue to allow her the alimony which definitely causes them loss and take up the proclamation concerning which we do not know if it will show profit or not this is no difficulty the case speaks of one who demands her kethubal in court in accord with Rabjuda in the name of Samuel for Rabjuda said in the name of Samuel one who claims her kethubal before the court receives no more alimony if so we should not attend to her at all since we attended to her at the beginning we attend to her at the end as well but at any rate on the view of RC our mission presents a difficulty no indeed I can maintain that the case is one of a heathen creditor but the reference is to one who accepted to have his case dealt with in accord with Israelite law if that is so let him not take interest he accepted Jewish law in the one respect but not in the other come and here one may not collect from it property of orphans except the worst land what case are we dealing with here would you say that the creditor is a heathen he surely would not agree to this hence you must say it deals with an Israelite creditor but then if he consumes interest how could we permit him to do so hence you must say that he did not consume interest and nevertheless we are taught that we dis tearing upon the orphan's property it will be right for our Yohanan for he will interpret it as referring to a woman's kethubah. But according to RC it will present a difficulty RC will tell you but even according to our Yohanan is it right if it refers to a kethuba why does he speak of the property of orphans even if it were his own it could be collected only from the worst land that is no difficulty it will be in accord with our Meir who holds that a woman's kethuba is collectible from a land of average quality but if from orphans property only from worse land at any rate according to RC the difficulty stands no indeed I can maintain that we deal with the case of a heathen creditor but it refers to one who has accepted upon himself that the case be dealt with according to Jewish law then let him not take interest either the cases that he accepted the law in respect of the one thing but not in respect of the other come in here for the purpose of paying a woman her kethuba or a creditor his debt now this will be right in the case of a creditor whether according to one master or to the other master as we have answered it but as for the case of the Ketubah that will be right according to our Yohanan but on the view of RC it will present a difficulty we speak here of the case where the debtor admitted the debt now that you have come to this explanation all the other teachings may also be explained as referring to the case that the debtor admitted in Ramar collected the Ketubah of a divorced woman from the orphan's property whereupon Rabbanah said to him but Rab Judah has said in the name of RC one must not dis tearing upon the property of orphans except if interest was consuming it or Yohanan says either because of a document of indebtedness bearing interest or because of the Ketubah of a woman so as to save from further payment on account of her alimony and even our Yohanan was including only the case of a widow because her alimony causes him loss but not in the case of a divorce he replied the reason for that ruling of our Yohanan we explained to be for favor's sake our said at first I would not dis tearing upon the property of orphans but when I heard the statement of our colleague Arhu not in the name of Rabbis for orphans who enjoy what does not belong to them let them follow him who left them from that time on I dis tearing upon it why not at first our Papa said the paying of a debt is a commandment
You like I can tell you the reference is to a kathuba the reason being for favor's sake or if you like I can tell you the reference is to a heathen creditor who accepted upon himself to have his case dealt with in accord with Israelite law but if he accepted that upon himself let him agree to wait until they are of age he accepted the law in the one respect but he did not accept it in the other respect come and here for the purpose of paying a woman her kathuba or a creditor his debt now. What case are we dealing with would you say that of a heathen creditor but would he agree hence it is evident that we deal with that of an Israelite creditor that then will be right on the view of Arhuna the son of our Joshua for he will interpret it as referring to the case where the debtor admitted his debt but according to our Papa granted that in the case of a kathuba where the reason may be for favor's sake but the case of the creditor would present a difficulty no indeed I can. Maintain it deals with a heathen creditor but in the case where he accepted upon himself to be judged in accord with the laws of Israel but if he accepted then let him accept to wait until they are of age he accepted upon himself the one thing but not the other Rabbah said we do not dis tyrain upon the orphan's property because of a possible quittance Arhuna the son of our Joshua said to Rabbah but do we consider the possibility of acquittance did we not learn if a woman collects her kathuba? In his absence she can do so only by means of an oath and Araha commander of the fortress said a case came before our Isaac the smith in Antioch and he decided we have learned that only in the case of a kathuba for favor's sake but not in the case of a creditor Rabbah however in the name of Arnaman said also in the case of a creditor now if we should consider the possibility of acquittance let us consider it there too there the reason is as we have stated it lest anyone take his neighbors. Possession and depart from maritime provinces. Rabbah said the law is we do not dis tyrain upon the property of orphans. But if he the father said give, then we dis tyrain upon it. If he said give this field or this mina, we dis tyrain upon it without appointing a guardian. But if he said give a field or a mina, we dis tyrain upon it and appoint a guardian. The Nihartian say in each case we dis tyrain upon it and appoint a guardian, except if it be found that the field does not belong to him, for we do not assume that the witnesses testified falsely. Our Ashi said therefore we do not dis tyrain upon the property of orphans. For Rabbah said the law is that we do not dis tyrain upon the property of orphans. But where we dis tyrain upon it, we appoint a guardian. For the Nihartian said in every case we dis tyrain upon the property of orphans and appoint a guardian, except in the case where it be found that the field does not belong to him, because we do not assume that the witnesses have testified falsely. Talmud, Masarak and Mishnah, if a man dedicates his possessions to the sanctuary whilst still liable for his wife's kathuba, our Eliezer says when he divorces her he must vow that he will not derive any further benefit from her, our Joshua says he need not do so likewise said Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel also if one guarantees a woman's kathuba and her husband divorces her the husband must vow to derive no benefit from her lest he make a conspiracy against the property of that man the guarantor and take his wife back again tomorrow wherein do they differ our Eliezer holds a man will engage in a conspiracy against the sanctuary but our Joshua holds that a man will not engage in a conspiracy against the sanctuary but what of the ruling of Arhunai if a person dangerously ill dedicated all his possessions to the sanctuary and said I owe so and so amina he is believed because of the presumption that nobody will engage in a conspiracy against the sanctuary shall we say that he gave a ruling. Concerning which Tanaim are conflicting, no, they dispute only the case of a healthy person, but with regard to one dangerously ill, all agree that he would not engage in a conspiracy against the sanctuary. Why? Because no man will sin where he does not stand to benefit thereby. Some there are who say, with regard to a healthy person, there is a general agreement that one he would engage in a conspiracy against the sanctuary, but here they differ with regard to a vow made in the presence of many. One master, our Joshua, holding such a vow can be annulled, while the other master, our Eliezer, holds it cannot be annulled. Or if you like, say, all agree that a vow made in the presence of many can be remitted, and they differ here as to a vow made on the authority of many, but then what of Amimar's statement that a vow made in the presence of many can be annulled, whereas one made on the authority of many cannot be annulled? Are we to say that he made a statement concerning which Tanaim are of divided? Opinion furthermore how explained our Joshua says he need not do so he should have said it would be useless rather they are disputing here on the principle as to whether absolution from consecration of an object may be obtained and thus it was taught if a man dedicates his possessions to the sanctuary whilst still liable for his wife's kathuba our Eliezer says when he divorces her he must vow that he will not derive any further benefit from her whilst our Joshua says he need not do so and our Eliezer be. Simeon said these are respectively the very views of Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel for Beth Shammai holds a consecration to the sanctuary made in error is valid consecration whilst Beth Hillel holds it is not valid consecration likewise did Rabban Simeon B. Gamaliel say etc. Moses B. Ezri was the guarantor for the kathuba of his daughter-in-law now Arhuna his son was a young scholar but in straight circumstances said Abbe is there no one to advise Arhuna to divorce his wife so that she might claim her kathuba from her father-in-law and he or might then take her back said Rabbah to him but we learned he must vow that he will not derive any further benefit from her and Abbe does everyone who divorces his wife do so before a court in the end it became known that he or was a priest whereupon Abbe exclaimed poverty pursues the poor but how could Abbe say thus did not Abbe say who is a cunningly wicked man he who offers advice to sell property in accord with Rabban. Simeon B. Gamaliel it is different in the case of one son and it is different also in the case of a young scholar but derive it from the fact that the guarantor for a kathuba is not held responsible Talmud, Masarak and B. He was a kabbalan that will be right according to him who holds that a kabbalan is held responsible although the debtor had no property at the time of contracting the debt but what can be said on the view that he is held responsible only if the debtor had property but if he has no property the Kabbalan is not responsible if you like say Arhuna had property but it was struck with blast and if you like say a father where his son is concerned will always hold himself responsible for it was stated as to a guarantor for a Kathuba all agree he is not held responsible the Kabbalan for a creditor all agree is held responsible in the case however of a guarantor for a creditor and a Kabbalan for a Kathuba there is a dispute there is one authority who holds that if the debtor had property he the Kabbalan is held responsible but if he had none he is not held responsible whereas there is another authority who holds that even if the debtor had no property he is also held responsible the law with regard to all cases is that though the debtor has no property the guarantor is responsible with the exception of the guarantor for a Kathuba who even though the husband had property is not held responsible for what reason he performed him is why and he caused her no loss there was a man who sold his possessions and divorced his wife our Joseph son of Rabbah sent her to our papa with the following question we learned in our mission about a guarantor about consecrated property what about a purchaser he replied shall the tana go on enumerating like a peddler the Nihardians said what we learned we learned and what we did not learn we did not learn said our Meshachay what is the reason of the Nihardians with regard to consecrated property the teaching is in order to safeguard the profit of the sanctuary also with regard to a guarantor the reason is because he performed him as why and did not cause her any loss but as for a purchaser since he must have known that upon everyone's possessions there is a kathuba as lean why did he go and buy it is he the buyer who caused damage to himself mission if a man dedicates his possessions to the sanctuary while still liable for his divorced wife's kathuba or in debt to a creditor then the wife cannot Collect her kathuba from the consecrated property nor the creditor his debt but he who redeems them must redeem for the purpose of paying the wife her kathuba or the creditor his debt if he had dedicated 90 minus worth of property whilst owing a hundred minus then he the creditor must add one dinar more and he redeems the property for the purpose of paying the kathuba to the wife or the debt to the creditor tomorrow why is it necessary to state he who redeems must redeem that is because of the teaching of our Abu for our Abu said less people say consecrated property goes out of the sanctuary without any redemption our mission will not be in accord with our Simeon B. Gamaliel for it was taught our Simeon B. Gamaliel said if his debt correspond with the value of the consecrated property then he redeems it but if not then he cannot redeem it and as for the rabbis to what extent must the debt correspond to the consecrated property our Hunabi Judah in the name of our she's hate said. Up to one half
Now since there is none to lend him these shall not be considered sufficient therefore we are informed that he is not told to sell the many and buy some more of the few if one dedicates all his possessions and one values even his tefillin there was a man who sold all his possessions he came before our Yamar he said to them take his tefillin away what is he teaching us it is taught in our mission if one dedicates his possessions and one values his tefillin you might have said there he thought that he was fulfilling a religious act but in the case of a sale you might say no one sells that wherewith he performs a personal commandment therefore he teaches us otherwise mission it is all one whether a man consecrates his goods or evaluates himself he has no claim to his wife's garment or his children's garment nor to the dyed clothes which he had dyed for their use nor to the new sandals which he has bought for their use although it was said slaves should be sold with their Garments to increase their value because when a garment for 30 dinars is bought for him his value is increased by a mean likewise with a cow if it be kept waiting to the market the IT increases in value as also a pearl if brought to a big city increases in value but the sanctuary can claim the value of anything only in its own place and at its own time tomorrow our rabbis taught and he shall give by valuation in that day that means one should not delay the sale of a pearl for poor people. As a holy thing unto the Lord i.e. general unspecified consecration belongs to the fund for repairs of the sanctuary C-H-A-P-T-E-R-B-I-I Mishnah one may not consecrate the field of his possession less than two years before the year of Jubilee nor redeem it less than one year after the year of Jubilee one may not reckon any months to the disadvantage of the sanctuary but the sanctuary may reckon months to its own advantage tomorrow the following contradiction was raised one may consecrate both before or after the year of Jubilee but in the year of Jubilee itself one should not consecrate and if one consecrated it is not consecrated Rab and Samuel both say this is what our mission means one cannot consecrate and then redeem at a deduction less than two years before the year of Jubilee and since one cannot consecrate to redeem at any reduction within less than two years let a man be careful with his possessions and let him not consecrate anything within less than two years of the Jubilee year it was stated if one consecrates his field in the year of Jubilee itself said Rab it is consecrated and he must pay fifty shekels but Samuel said it has not acquired any sanctity whatsoever to the Sergios of Timur it is right that Samuel conflicts with Rab in matters of a sale for there is an argument of Forshiori if a field that had been sold returns now to its former owner how much more so that one that had not been sold yet should not be saleable now but here what Argument of Forshiori can be made surely we learned if the Jubilee year has arrived and it was not yet redeemed the priests enter into possession of it and they pay its value so our Judah Samuel holds with our Simeon who said they enter into possession but they do not pay anything Talmud, Masara can be Rab however holds at any rate it does eventually not return to the owners it is to the priests that it goes and the priests obtain it from the table of the Most High what is the reason of Rab's view. Scripture said if from the year of Jubilee he shall sanctify his field the year of Jubilee being included and Samuel is it written if in the year of Jubilee it is written if from the year of Jubilee i.e. from the year after the year of Jubilee it is all well according to Rab hence it is written if from the year of Jubilee and also and if after the Jubilee but according to Samuel what means and if after the Jubilee it means after after an objection was raised one may consecrate a field. Both before and after the year of Jubilee, but in the year of Jubilee itself, one should not consecrate, and if one has consecrated, no sanctity attaches to the field. Rab will tell you it means it acquires no sanctity so as to be redeemable at a deduction, but it is consecrated, and one must pay the full fifty shekels for the redemption. This implies that if one consecrates before the Jubilee year, it would be sanctified and redeemable at a deduction, but have not Rab and Samuel both declared. One cannot consecrate to redeem at a deduction less than two years before the Jubilee. Rab will tell you this is a view of the rabbis, but I hold with Rabbi who said the first day includes the first day, the seventh day includes the seventh day, so here too from the year of Jubilee includes the year of Jubilee, but if this is a view of Rabbi, where does the Pontian come in? And if you were to say he ignored the Pontian, surely we learned if a man consecrated two or three years before the Jubilee said Rabbi I hold that he must pay a seller shekel and a pontian rabbi is of the view of our Judah who said the fiftieth year is counted both ways shall we say then that Samuel holds rabbi to be in accord with the rabbis for if his rabbis view were in accord with that of our Judah it should read one seller and two pontians hence we must say that on the view of Samuel rabbi agrees with the rabbis come and hear nor redeem it less than one year after the year of Jubilee this will be right. For Samuel's view for one cannot indeed redeem it less than one year after the year of Jubilee but according to Rab what means not less than a year after the Jubilee do you think that after the year of Jubilee is to be taken literally no after the year of Jubilee means in the midst of the Jubilee Talmud, Masa for as long as a year is not complete it cannot be deducted what is he teaching us that one does not reckon months to the disadvantage of the sanctuary but that was expressly. Taught in the Mishnah one may not reckon any months to the disadvantage of the sanctuary he gives the reason why is it ruled nor redeem it less than one year after the year of Jubilee because one does not reckon the months to the disadvantage of the sanctuary our rabbis taught once do we know that one does not reckon months to the disadvantage of the sanctuary the text states then the priest shall reckon unto him the money according to the years that remain i.e. you may reckon years. But not months once do we know that if you desire to add the months so as to consider them one year you can do so as e.g. if he consecrated the field in the middle of the 48th year therefore the text states then the priest shall reckon unto him in any case Mishnah if a man consecrated his field at the time when the law of the Jubilee is in force he must pay 50 shekels for every piece of field sufficient for the sowing of a homer of barley if the field contained ravines 10. Handbreadths deep or rocks ten handbreadths high they are not included in the measure but if less than this they are included if he consecrated it two or three years before the jubilee then he must pay one sell a shekel and one pontian for each year if he says I shall pay for each year as it comes one does not listen to him but he must pay for all the years together it is all the same whether the owner or anyone else redeems the field wherein and does the owner differ from any other man in that the owner must add one fifth whereas any other man need not add one fifth tomorrow a tan taught a field requiring one core seed but not one yielding a core crop strewn with the hand not with oxen levi taught neither too thick nor too thin but in average manner if the field contains ravines etc but let them be treated as if they had been consecrated separately and if you were to say that since they are not sufficient for the sowing of a core they cannot become consecrated surely it was Taught field what does that mean to teach because it is said the sowing of a homer of barley shall be valued at fifty shekels of silver from this I know only the law if he consecrated it in this manner once do I know to include also a lethek half a lethek sei or half a sei a tarkab or half a tarkab therefore scripture says field of any size marak babi hammer replied here the reference is to ravines full of water which cannot be sown infer that also from the fact that the clefts were mentioned in an analogous position to that of rocks this proves it but then also smaller areas than ten handbreadths two ought not to be included those are called small clefts of the earth or spines of the earth if he consecrated it two or three years etc our rabbis taught and an abatement shall be made from the valuation also from the sanctuary so that if the sanctuary enjoyed the property for two or three years or even if it did not enjoy it but had it in its possession one may Deduct one sella and one pontian for each year if he says I shall pay each year etc. Our rabbis taught once do we know that if the owner said I shall pay for each year as it comes that we do not listen to him therefore the text says then the priest shall reckon unto him the money i.e. until the whole sum is together it is all the same whether it be the owner or someone else except that the owner must add one fifth whereas any other man need not add the fifth mission if a man consecrated his field and then redeemed it it does not go out of his possession in the jubilee if his son redeemed it it reverts to his father in the jubilee if another or a relative redeemed it and he redeemed it from his hand it goes out to the priest if one of the priests redeemed it and it was still in his possession then he cannot say since it goes out to the priest in the year of jubilee and since it is now in my possession therefore it belongs to me but it goes out of his possession to be distributed. Among all his brethren the priests Talmud, Masarak and Bigamara are rabbis taught and if he will not redeem the field i.e. the owner or if he have sold the field i.e. the treasurer of the sanctuary to another man i.e. to another man but not to his son you say to
Inheritance the daughter where there is a son is considered an outsider she cannot preserve the field come and here for the school of our Ishmael taught whosoever is considered an outsider where there is a son cannot preserve the field and she too is considered an outsider where there is a son our Zyra asked who can preserve the field for a woman shall I say the husband can preserve it for her since he inherits here or perhaps the son can preserve it for her because he takes of what is coming due to the estate as he does of what is held in actual possession the question remains unanswered Rama Biham asked of our Hisdag if one dedicates his field less than two years before the year of Jubilee does it go out to the priest he replied what do you think because an abatement shall be made from the valuation but the field when it goeth out in the Jubilee from which you would infer that the law applies only to a field subject to the law of deduction but not to one which is not subject to the law of deduction on the contrary scripture says and if he will not redeem the field the field when it goeth out in the jubilee etc and this field too is subject to redemption if one of the priests redeemed it or rabbis taught the possession thereof shall be the priests what does that come to teach the following whence do we know that if a field is to go out on jubilee to the priests and one of the priests redeems it that he cannot say since it would go out to a priest anyway and it is in my possession now let it belong to me on an argument ad majus if i can acquire title to something belonging to others how much more to something belonging to myself therefore the text reads his possession of possession which is his but this one is not his how then do we deal with such a field it goes out of his hand and is distributed among his brethren the priest's mission if the year of jubilee arrived and it was not yet redeemed then the priests enter into Possession thereof and pay its value. These are the words of Arjuna. Our Simeon says they enter into possession, but they do not pay its value. Our Eliezer says they neither enter into possession nor pay its value, but it is called an abandoned field until the second jubilee. If the second jubilee has arrived and it was not yet redeemed, it is called a twice abandoned field until the third jubilee. The priests never enter into possession thereof until someone else had redeemed it. Tomorrow, what is the reason of Arjuna's view? He derives it from the analogous holy, holy written with the consecration of a house, just as their redemption is impossible without payment of money. So here also payment of money is mandatory. And our Simeon he derives it from the analogous holy, holy written with the lambs of the feast of weeks, just as there the priest obtains them without money. So here too without money, but let Arjuna to infer it from the lambs of the feast of weeks one may make. Inference for objects consecrated to repairs of the sanctuary Talmud, Masarakana from other objects dedicated to repairs of the sanctuary but one may make no inference for objects dedicated to temple repairs from such as are dedicated to the altar but let our Simeon to derive it from one who consecrated his house one may make inference for things given as a gift to the priests from others which are a gift unto priests but one may not make inference for things which are a gift to the priests. From others which are not a gift to the priests our Eliezer says they neither enter into possession nor pay its value Rabbi said what is the reason for our Eliezer's view scripture said and if he will not redeem the field it shall not be redeemed anymore or if he have sold the field to another man then the field when it goeth out in the jubilee said Abbe a sharp knife to cut scriptural verses to pieces rather said Abbe this is the reason for our Eliezer's view as it was taught it. Shall not be redeemed anymore. One might have assumed that means it shall not be redeemed by the owners, i.e., even to be considered to him a field acquired by purchase. Therefore, scripture says anymore, which means it cannot be redeemed so as to be considered again what it was before a field of possession, but it can be redeemed to become to him like a field acquired by purchase. Now, to when does this refer? Will you say to the first jubilee, why can it not be redeemed? It is still a field of possession. Hence, is it obviously to the second jubilee that we refer? But according to whom is this teaching? What you say according to either our Judah or our Simeon? Surely it goes out to the priest at the first jubilee. You must hence say it is in accord with our Eliezer, which proves that our Eliezer infers his reason from here. But is that how you think? How then do our Judah and our Simeon interpret that anymore? Rather, we speak here of a field of possession that went out to the priest at Jubilee in which the priests thereupon consecrated and now the original owner comes to redeem it you might have assumed that it cannot be redeemed by the owner not even to be regarded as a field acquired by purchase therefore the text states any more meaning it cannot be redeemed so as to be considered as before a field of possession but it can be redeemed to be considered a field acquired by purchase and then indeed was it taught in the year of Jubilee the field shall return unto him of whom it was bought one might have assumed that it shall go back to the treasurer from whom he bought it therefore the text states even to him to whom the possession of the land belongeth now scripture should only have said even to him to whom the possession of the land belongeth for what purpose does it say unto him of whom it was bought it refers to the case of a field that had gone out to the priest whereupon the priest sold it and the purchaser consecrated it and another person came and redeemed it one might have assumed that it shall revert to the original owners therefore it is said unto him of whom it was bought and it was necessary to state unto him of whom it was bought and it was necessary to state it shall not be redeemed anymore for if the divine law had written only it shall not be redeemed anymore one would have said that this applied only to the former case where it does not come back at all to the one who consecrated it but here where it reverts to the one who consecrated it i might have said it shall revert to the owner therefore the divine law wrote unto him of whom it was bought and if the divine law had written only unto him of whom it was bought one would have said that this applies to the latter case where the owner does not pay its value but here in the former case where he pays its value i might say it shall be placed in his possession therefore the divine law wrote it shall not be redeemed and if the divine law had Written it shall not be redeemed, but had not written any more. I would have thought it cannot be redeemed at all. Therefore, the divine law said any more. I.e., it cannot revert to its original status again, but it can be so redeemed as to be regarded a field acquired by purchase. Now, what of it? Rabbi said, Scripture said, but the field when it goeth out in the jubilee, etc., implying when it goeth out on jubilee of the hand possession of another Talmud, Masarak and B. The question was asked, is it owner in the second jubilee cycle considered like someone else or not come and here it shall not be redeemed any more? One might have assumed it shall not be redeemed by the owners even to be considered before him like a field acquired by purchase. Therefore, it is said any more. I.e., it cannot be redeemed so as to be considered again what it was before, but it can be redeemed so as to become to him like a field acquired by purchase. Now, to what does this refer? Will you say to the first jubilee? Why? Should it not be redeemed it is still regarded a field of possession hence the reference is obviously to the second jubilee but according to whose view is this teaching if according to our Judah or our Simeon surely it goes out to the priests at the first jubilee one must rather say therefore it is in accord with our Eliezer which proves that according to him the owner in the second jubilee is considered as if he were another person but do you think so how then would our Judah and our Simeon interpret any more rather do we deal here with the case of a field of possession that went out at jubilee to the priests and which the priest consecrated and now the original owner comes to redeem it you might have thought it cannot be redeemed by the owner so as to become like a field acquired by purchase therefore it is said any more i.e. it cannot be redeemed so as to be considered what it was before but it can be redeemed so as to become to him a field acquired by purchase thus also was it taught the field shall return unto him of whom it was bought one might have assumed it shall return to the treasurer from whom he had bought it therefore the text states even to him unto whom the possession of the land belongeth now scripture should have said unto whom the possession of the land belongeth for what purpose does it say unto him of whom the field was bought it refers to a field that had gone out to the priest and the priest sold it whereupon the purchaser consecrated it and another person came and redeemed it one might have assumed that it shall revert to the original owner therefore it is said unto him of whom it was bought and it was necessary to write it shall not be redeemed anymore as it was necessary to write unto him of whom it was bought for had the divine lord written only it shall not be redeemed anymore one would have said that applies only in the former case where it does not come back at all to the one who consecrated it but here where it does Revert to him, I might have said it shall revert to the owner, therefore the divine law wrote unto him of whom it was bought, and if the divine law had written only unto him of whom it was bought, one would have said this applies to the latter case where the owner does not pay its money value, but here in the former case where he pays its money value, it shall be placed in his possession, therefore the divine law wrote it shall not be redeemed, and if the divine law had written only it shall not be redeemed, but had not written any more, I might have said that it
a possession as it is said and if a field which he had bought which is not a field of his possession i.e. a field which is not capable of becoming a field of his possession thus excluding a field which is capable of becoming a field of possession a field acquired by purchase does not go out to the priest in the year of jubilee for no man can consecrate an object not belonging to him priests and levites may consecrate their fields at any time and redeem at any time both before and after the Jubilee Gemara our rabbis taught whence do we know that if one bought a field from his father and consecrated it and thereupon his father died that it is to be considered his field of possession therefore it is said a field which he hath bought which is not a field of his possession i.e. field which is not capable of becoming a field of his possessions excluding this which is capable of becoming a field of his possession these are the words of our Judah and our Simeon our Meir says whence do we know that if one bought a field from his father and his father died and he thereupon consecrated it that it be considered to him a field of his possession therefore it is said a field which he hath bought which is not a field of his possession i.e. a field which is not a field of his possession excluding this which is a field of his possession shall we say that they are conflicting about this principle our Meir holding that the acquisition of usufruct is like the acquisition of the capital itself Whereas our Judah and our Simeon hold that the acquisition of Yusufruct is not like the acquisition of the soil itself, said Arnam and B. Isaac as a rule, our Simeon and our Judah hold that the acquisition of Yusufruct is like the acquisition of the soil itself, Talmud, Masarak and Abadir, they found a scriptural verse which they interpreted as follows, the divine law should have said it from a field acquired by purchase which is not his field of possession or which is not a field of possession, what? Does from a field of his possession mean it means a field incapable of becoming a field of possession, thus excluding this which is capable of becoming a field of possession, priests and Levites may consecrate at any time, granted that it is necessary to teach that the priests may redeem to exclude Israelites who may redeem only up to the year of Jubilee, that is why we are informed that priests and Levites may redeem at any time, but as regards their ability to consecrate, why teach? About priests and levites since Israelites may do the same and if you were to say it refers to the year of Jubilee itself that would be right only on the view of Samuel who says in the year of Jubilee itself if the consecrated object acquires no sacred character therefore the information in our mission that priests and levites however may consecrate at any time but on the view of Rabbi speak about priests and levites Israelites too may consecrate at any time even in the year of Jubilee. But according to your own opinion for what purpose does he teach both before and after the Jubilee rather must we explain because he taught in the first part before the Jubilee and after the Jubilee therefore he taught in the second part too both before and after the year of Jubilee and since he taught in the first part they may neither consecrate nor redeem he teaches also in the second part priests may consecrate it and redeem chapterbii mission if one consecrated his Field at a time when the law of the Jubilee was no longer valid they say to him make thou the first beginning because the owner must pay an added fifth whereas no other person need pay an additional fifth that happened that one consecrated his field because it was bad they said to him make thou the first beginning he said I will acquire it for an Isar Jose said he did not speak thus but for an egg because consecrated objects may be redeemed by either money or money's worth he said to him it has become thine thus he was found to have lost an Isar and the field was his again Gamar if one consecrated his field at a time when etc they say but was it not taught they compel him what they say means is they compel him or if you like say at first they speak to him if he obeys he obeys if not they compel him for the owner must pay an added fifth why argue from the fact that the owner is obliged to pay an added fifth infer it from the fact that since it is dear to him he will pay more to Redeem it and furthermore the obligation to redeem it rests upon the owner he gives one reason and then another one reason that since it is dear to him he will pay more to redeem it and another that the obligation to redeem it rests upon the owner and furthermore the owner is obliged to pay an added fifth it happened that one consecrated his field etc shall we say they are disputing this principle our Jose holds that money's worth is like money whilst the rabbis are of the opinion that money's worth is not like money but then we have an established principle that money's worth is like money no all agree that money's worth is like money but here they are disputing whether one may redeem by an object the fifth of which is not worth one parata the first tana holding only with an isar the fifth of which is worth one parata may one redeem but not by less whilst our Jose holds with an egg to one may redeem he said to him it has become thine thus he was found to have lost an isar. And the field was his again. This anonymous statement is in accord with the view of the rabbi's mission. If one said, I will acquire it for ten cellars, and another for twenty, and another for thirty, and another for forty, and another for fifty, and he that bid fifty recanted, they take pledges from his property up to ten cellars. If he that bid forty recanted, they take pledges from his possession up to ten cellars. If he that bid thirty recanted, they take pledges from his possessions up to ten cellars. If he that bid twenty recanted, they take pledges from his possession up to ten cellars. If he that bid ten recanted, they sell the field for what it is worth and collect what remains from him who bid ten. If the owner bid twenty and any other man bid twenty, then the owner comes first because he must add one fifth. If one said, I will acquire it for twenty-one cellars, Talmud, Masarak and B, then the owner must pay twenty-six. If one bid twenty-two, the owner must pay twenty-seven. If twenty. 3 the owner must pay 28 if 24 the owner must pay 29 if 25 the owner must pay 30 for they need not add 1 fifth to what the other bids more if one said I will acquire it for 26 and if the owner was willing to pay 31 and 1 dinar in addition the owner comes first and if not we say to the other it has become thine Gemara Arhista said this was taught only if he who bid 40 stands by his bid but if he who bid 40 does not stand by his bid then we divide it among them we learned if he that bid 40 recanted they take pledges from his possessions up to 10 cellars but why so let him who bid 50 pay with a like him the 10 cellars which he outbid it refers to the case where there was no one who bid 50 if he who bid 30 recanted they take pledges from his POS sessions up to 10 cellars but why so let him who bid 40 pay together with him the 10 cellars which he outbid it refers to the case where there was no one who bid forty if he who bid twenty recanted they take pledges from his possessions up to ten sellers but why so let him who bid thirty pay with him it refers to the case where there was no one who bid thirty but if that be so read the last part if he that bid ten recanted they sell it for what it is worth and collect what remains from him who bid ten but let him who bid twenty pay with him the ten sellers and if you would say here too it refers to the case where there was no one who bid ten then instead of teaching and collect what remains from him who bid ten it should state and collect from him rather said our this is no difficulty one case refers to the recanting simultaneously the other if they do so one after the other thus was it also taught if all of them recanted simultaneously one distributed it among them but we were taught they take pledges from his possession up to ten sellers hence it is evident therefrom that the explanation is like our that is evident some put it in the form of a contradiction we learned if he who bid ten recanted they sell it for what it is worth and collect what remains from him who bid ten but it was taught we divided among them our hista said this is no contradiction one case speaks of their recanting simultaneously the other if they do so one after the other if the owner bid twenty and any other man bid twenty etc shall we say that the added fifth has preference but I will point out a contradiction if a householder bid a seller and another bid a seller and an isar he who bid a seller and an isar has preference since he adds to the principal value here where the fifth is the profit of the sanctuary the fifth has preference but there where the fifth is the profit of the householder a goodly capital sum is preferable for redemption but the fifth does not concern us if one said I will acquire it for etc if twenty five the owner must pay thirty but let the owner say a man has come in our stead said ZIRA Speaks of the case where the owner had bid one dinar over twenty, then let the Mishnah mention that dinar he the Tana was not particular to mention a mere dinar, but yet it teaches if the owner was willing to pay thirty one sellers and one dinar the owner has preference rather said Rabbah it was a case where the owner bid an additional parata and the Tana was not particular to mention it for they need not add one fifth to what the other bids more are his da said this was taught only. For the case where the consecrated object was not yet valued by three, but if the consecrated object was valued by three he must add the fifth it was also taught thus Beth I say they must add whilst Beth Hillel say they need not add now how shall we imagine this case if if the consecrated object has not yet been valued what is the reason for the view of Beth Shammai? rather must we
heard of his Canaanite man servants or maid servants or of his field of possession, but if he devoted the whole of them, they are not considered validly devoted. This is a view of our Eliezer, our Eliezer, Bezer, Yah said, if even to the highest no one is permitted to devote all his possessions, how much more should one be careful about sparing in regard to one's possessions? Tomorrow, whence do we know these things? Because our rabbis taught of all that he hath, i.e., but not all that he has of man, but not all man or of beast, but not all beast of the field of his possession, but not all the field of his possession. One might have assumed that he may not at the outset devote the whole, but if he had done so, it should be considered validly devoted. Therefore, it is said, notwithstanding, these are the words of our Eliezer, our Eliezer, Bezer, Yah said, if even to the highest no one is permitted to devote all his possessions, how much more should one be sparing in regard to his possessions and all the Details are necessary for if the divine law had but written of all that he had I might have said he may not devote all that he has but of one kind he may devote all objects therefore the divine law said of man i.e. but not all man and if the divine law had but written of man I would have said because without labor none can manage but in the case of a field he can still make a living by working as a serf therefore it stated of the field of his possession and if the divine law had taught us about these two I would have said the reason in both these cases is that each is vitally necessary but as for movable property let him be allowed to devote it all therefore it was necessary to teach about that as well why was or beast necessary in accordance with what was taught one might have assumed that a man may devote his son or daughter his Hebrew manservant or his field or purchase therefore it is said or beast i.e. just as a beast is something he may sell so may he Devote only such things as he is permitted to sell, but as he is permitted to sell his minor daughter, I might therefore think that he can devote her as well. Therefore, it is said, or beast, i.e., just as a beast is something which he may sell forever, so can he devote only such objects as he is permitted to sell forever. Our Eliezer, Bezer, Yah said, if even to the highest no one is permitted, etc. But that is exactly what the first Tana has said. The difference between them is implied in what our Ella said. For our Ella said in Isha, they ordained that one who would distribute his possessions must not go beyond one fifth of them. It happened that one wanted to distribute more than one fifth, and his colleagues would not permit him to do so. Who was that our Yeshivab? Some say it was our Yeshivab who wanted to distribute it, and his colleagues would not let him do so. Who was chief among them? Our Akiba Mishnah, if one devotes his son or his daughter or his Hebrew manservant or maidservant or the field. Which he acquired by purchase, they are not considered validly devoted, for none can devote a thing which does not belong to him. Priests and Levites cannot devote their belongings. These are the words of Arjuna. Our Simeon says the priests cannot devote because things devoted belong to them, but Levites can devote because things devoted do not fall to them. Rabbi says the words of Arjuna are acceptable in cases of immovable property, as it is said, for that is their perpetual possession. And the words of Ar Simeon in cases of movable property, since things devoted do not fall to them, are according to Arjuna, it is quite right that priests cannot devote because all objects devoted fall to them, but touching love, it's granted they cannot devote immovable property because it is written for that is their perpetual possession, but let them devote movable property. Scripture said of all that he hath or of the field of his possession, thus comparing movable property on the same level with. Immovable property now according to our Simeon it is quite right what he rules about the priest as we have just said but touching the love it's granted they can devote movable property because he does not draw the above analogy but why should they be able to devote immovable property surely it is written for that is their perpetual possession what he means when he says Levites can devote is that they can devote movables but surely the last part of this mission reads Rabbi says the words of Arjuna are acceptable in cases of immovable property and the words of our Simeon in cases of movable property it follows that our Simeon refers to immovable property too this is what he means Rabbi said the words of Arjuna are acceptable to our Simeon in cases of immovable property for our Simeon disputes his view only in cases of movable property but in cases of immovable property he consents our high Bob and said if one had devoted movable property he may give it to any priest he pleases as it is Said everything devoted in Israel Talmud, Masarak and B shall be thine if he devoted his field he must give it to a priest of the then officiating guard as it is said as a field devoted the possession thereof shall be the priests making the inference from the analogy of the term the priests in case of robbery of a stranger and whence do we know it for that case for it was taught the lords even the priests i.e. the lord acquired it and gave it to the priest in that guard you say to the priest in that particular guard but perhaps it means to any priest it pleases him to give it to when it says besides the realm of the atonement whereby atonement shall be made for him hence scripture speaks of the priest in that guard the field which goes out to the priest in the year of jubilee is also given to the priest of that particular guard the following question was raised how if it fell on a sabbath or high bmi in the name of Hulfana, said it is to be given to the departing Guard Arnaman B. Isaac said thus was it also taught it is to be found then that both the year of Jubilee and the seventh year effect respectively the release of debts and land at the same time except that the year of Jubilee effects it in its beginning and the seventh year at its end on the contrary it was just because of the say because the year of Jubilee etc. granted that the seventh year effects release at the end as it is written at the end of every seven years thou shalt make a release but how does the year of Jubilee effect release at the beginning that takes place on the day of atonement as it is written in the day of atonement shall you make proclamation with the horn throughout all your land this is a view of Arishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka who said that the year of Jubilee commenced from the new year already Hezekiah son of Bilo he heard it and he went and reported it to our the letter asked but let him compare movable property to immovable. Property, but is it not a matter of dispute among Tanaim? There being some who compare the one to the other, whilst some there are who do not, and he or high B. Abin holds with the view that we do not make that comparison. Mishnah things devoted for the use of the priests cannot be redeemed, but are to be given to the priest, even as Terah Mar Judah be. But there is says things devoted generally fall to the fund for temple repairs, as it was said, every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. But the sages say things devoted generally fall to the priest, as it is said, as a field devoted, the possession thereof shall be the priest. If so, why is it said every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord? That is to teach that is applies to the most holy and the less holy things. A man may devote what he has already consecrated, whether they be most holy things or less holy things. If they had been consecrated as a vow, he must give their value. If as a free will offering, he must give what it is. Word to him if he, he said let this ox be a burnt offering one estimates how much a man would pay for the ox to offer it as a burnt offering which he was not obliged to offer a firstling whether unblemished or blemished may be devoted and how can it be redeemed they who redeem it estimate what a man would give for this firstling in order to give it to the son of his daughter or to the son of his sister Talmud, Masarak and the Gemara our rabbis taught things devoted to the priests cannot be redeemed but must be given to the priests things devoted as long as they are in the house of their owners are in every respect as objects consecrated as it is said every devoted thing in Israel is most holy unto the Lord once given to the priests they are in every respect profane as it is said every devoted thing in Israel shall be thine Arjuna be but there is said things devoted generally fall to the fund for temple repairs it is all right as to the rabbis for they have explained their own Reason as well as the verses by Arjuna be but there but what does Arjuna be but there do with as a field devoted he needs it for what has been taught as a field devoted the possession thereof shall be the priest what does that teach us whence do we know that if a priest consecrates his field which he derived from devotion he may not say since it falls to the priest at Jubilee and is now in my possession it shall remain mine and it is arguable and or if I acquire title to what belongs to others how much more can I do so with what belongs to me therefore it is written as a field devoted the possession thereof shall be the priest what now is it that we learn from a field devoted this comes to throw light and it itself illumined his field which he derived from devotion is compared with an Israelite's field of possession just as an Israelite's field of possession goes out of his hand and is distributed among the priests at Jubilee thus also his field which he Derived from devotion goes out of his hands and is distributed among his brethren the priests and the other they derive this from the fact that instead of devoting things is written the devoted thing and the other the argument from devoted the devoted does not convey any inference to him once does Arjuna be but there and know that it applies to the most holy and to less holy things he holds as does our Ishmael Rab said the Halachah is like
holds that things devoted generally fall to the priests and objection was raised the law of the Hebrew slave applies only as long as the Jubilee applies as it is said he shall serve with thee unto the year of Jubilee neither does the law concerning a devoted field apply except at the time when the law of the Jubilee applies as it is said and in the Jubilee it shall go out and he shall return unto his possessions the law touching houses in walled cities applies only as long as the law of it Jubilee applies as it is said it shall not go out in the Jubilee are Simeon he said the law concerning a devoted field applies only at the time in which the law of the Jubilee applies as it is said but the field when it goeth out in the Jubilee shall be holy unto the Lord as a field devoted are Simeon Eliezer said the law concerning the resident alien applies only at the time when the law of the Jubilee applies said B.B. what is the reason because it is inferred from the analogous well well. Here it is written because he fareth well with thee and there it is written where it liked him well thou shalt not wrong him this is no difficulty the one refers to immovable property the other to movable property but the case of Pamadai the referred also to immovable property immovable property outside the land is like movable property in the land of Israel Mishnah Arishmael said one verse says all the firstling males thou shalt sanctify and another verse says the firstlings amongst beast no man shall sanctify it is not possible to say thou shalt sanctify since it was said already no man shall sanctify and it is not possible to say one shall not sanctify since it is also written thou shalt sanctify how then you may sanctify it by consecrating its value to the owner but you may not sanctify it by consecrating itself to the altar Gemara and the rabbis no man shall sanctify is required to render such consecration for the altar transgression of a prohibition thou shalt Sanctify is necessary in accord with what was taught once do we know that if one had a firstling born to him among his flock that he is commanded formally to sanctify it because it is said the firstling thou shalt sanctify and are Ishmael if he did not sanctify it would it not be sacred it is sacred from his dam's womb since therefore it is holy even if it be not specially sanctified there is no need to sanctify it Talmud, Masarak and B-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-X mission if one sold his field a possession at the time when the law of the Jubilee was in force he may not redeem it until after a time of less than two years as it is written according to the number of the years of the crops he shall sell unto thee if among the two there was a year of blight or mildew or a seventh year it is not included in the reckoning if he only broke the ground without planting or left it fallow for a year that year is included in the reckoning R-L-A-Zer says if he sold it to him before the New year whilst it was still full of fruit he enjoys three crops in two years Gamar if one sold his field at the time when the law of the Jubilee was in force etc. It does not state he cannot redeem but he may not redeem this shows that it is even prohibited so that it is forbidden even to clapper Zeus to him to rouse his love of money and it is not necessary to state that the seller in redeeming it acts against a positive command as it is written according to the number of the years of the crops he shall sell unto thee but even the purchaser transgresses a positive commandment as we require according to the number of the years thou shalt buy which was not done here it was stated if one sells his field in the year of Jubilee itself Rab said it is sold but goes out immediately whilst Samuel said it is not sold at all what is the reason of Samuel's view it is an argument a minority of a field that was already sold goes out in the Jubilee it is not logical that one which is not sold yet cannot be sold now, but according to Rab, do we not argue a minority in such a case? Was it not taught one might have assumed that a man can sell his daughter when she is NAR? Alas, therefore, one argues a minority if she who was sold already goes out free. Is it not logical that if not sold yet she cannot be sold now? There she cannot be sold again, but here at the field can be sold again. An objection was raised years after the Jubilee, thou shalt buy that teaches that one may sell immediately after the year of the Jubilee. Whence do we know that one may sell at a period removed from the year of Jubilee? Therefore, it is said according to the multitude of the years and according to the fewness of the years in the year of Jubilee itself, one may not sell. And if he has sold a field, it is not validly sold. Rab will answer you, it means it is not sold according unto the number of the years of the crops, but it is sold and goes out immediately. But if it is legally Sold let it remain in his possession until after the year of the Jubilee and after the Jubilee let him enjoy the two years of the crops and thereupon return it for was it not taught if he enjoyed it one year before the Jubilee one lets him complete the two years by one year after the Jubilee there he has started enjoying it but here he has not started to enjoy it or and said I heard from Mar Samuel two things one in relation to this point and the other in relation to the statement if one sells his slave to an idolater or outside the land of Israel he goes out free in one case he said the purchase money is returned and in the other it is not returned and I do not know which is which said our Joseph let us see it was taught in a very if one sells his slave outside the land of Israel he goes out free and he requires a document of manumission from his second master now since he refers to the second as his master it is evident that the purchase money is not returned and it is therefore here that Samuel said it is not sold and the purchase money is returned Talmud, Masarak and Aaron and as to the Beretha he had not heard it and as far as Samuel's teaching is concerned whence the evidence that it means that it is not sold and the money is returned perhaps it means it is not sold and the money is to be considered a gift just as is the case of one who betrothed his sister for it was stated if one betrothed his sister Rab said the betrothal money is to be returned and Samuel holds that the money is regarded as a gift Abbe said to our Joseph why do you find it proper that we penalize the purchaser let us penalize the seller he answered not the mouse has stolen the whole has stolen but if there were no mouse whence would the whole have its theft it is reasonable that we penalize him with whom the forbidden stuff is found if there was a year of blight etc if it is included in the reckoning even when he left it fellow for a year is it Necessary to state that it is included if he broke the ground it is necessary for you might have thought we say to him pay him the money which the breaking of the ground cost and he will go therefore we are informed that we do not say so our Eliezer said if he sold it to him etc it was taught our Eliezer said once do we know that if he sold him the field before the new year whilst it was full of fruit that he cannot say to him leave it before me as I have left it before you therefore it is said according to the number of years of the crops he shall sell unto the i.e. it may happen that a man enjoys three crops in two years mission if he sold it to the first for one hundred dinars and the first sold it to the second for two hundred then he need reckon only with the first for it is written then let him count the sale thereof unto the man to whom he sold it if he sold it to the first for two hundred and the first sold it to the second for a hundred then he need reckon only with the second for it is said then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it i.e. unto the man who is in possession thereof one may not sell a distant field in order to redeem a nearer one nor redeem a poor field in order to redeem one that is good nor borrow money in order to redeem it nor redeem it by halves but in the case of objects consecrated all these things are permitted in this respect more stringency attaches to common property than to consecrated objects Gemara our rabbis taught if he sold it to the first one for one hundred and the first sold it to the second for two hundred whence do we know that he need reckon but with the first therefore it is said unto the man to whom he sold it if he sold it to the first for two hundred and the first sold it to the second for a hundred whence do we know that he need reckon but with the second therefore it is said unto the man in whose possession it is these are the Words of Rabbi Ardos Tabi Judah said if he sold it to him for 100 and he improved it so that its value amounted now to 200 whence do we know that he need reckon it only as worth 100 therefore it is said let him restore the overplus i.e. the overplus which is left in his hand if he sold it to him for 200 and it depreciated and is worth now only 100 whence do we know that he need reckon it only as worth 100 therefore it is said let him restore the overplus i.e. the overplus that is in the soil what is the practical difference between these two authorities if it was more valuable then became less valuable than more valuable again but whence do we know that the counting is in the direction of leniency perhaps it is to be on the side of stringency do not think so for we infer it from redemption written here and redemption written in connection with the Hebrew slave but whence do we know it therefore it was taught if he was sold for a hundred and appreciated in value and stood at two hundred whence do we know that he is assessed only at one hundred therefore it is said he shall give back the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for if he was sold for two hundred and appreciated and stood at a hundred whence do we know that he is assessed only at a hundred
accordance with what our Jose B. Hanada said for our Jose B. Hanada said come and see how hard is the very dust of violating the laws of the seventh year for a man who sells and buys the produce of the seventh year ultimately must sell his movable property as it is said in this year of jubilee shall return every man unto his possession and it is said and if thou sell out unto thy neighbor or buy of thy neighbor's hand i.e. something which is acquired from hand to hand if he does not perceive this he eventually must sell his fields as it is said if thy brother be waxen poor and sell some of his possessions he has no opportunity of amending his ways until he sells his house as is added and if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city why state there if he does not perceive and here he has no opportunity this is in accord with Arhuna for Arhuna said once a man has committed a transgression and repeated it, it is permitted to him permitted to him how could you think so say rather it becomes as permitted to him it is not brought home to him until he sells his daughter as it is said and if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant and although the sale of the daughter is not mentioned in the section he teaches us that a man should rather sell his daughter than borrow on usury for in the former case she goes on making deductions and goes out free whereas here the debt becomes ever larger it is not brought home to him until he sells himself as it is said and if thy Brother be waxen poor with thee and sell himself to thee and not even unto thee but unto a proselyte as it is said unto the proselyte and not even to a proselyte of righteousness but to a resident alien as it is said or unto the resident alien a proselyte's family i.e. an idolater when it is said to the stock it means one who sells himself to become a servant to an idol itself he replied but scripture restores him to his brethren's regard for the school of our Ishmael taught since this one went and sold himself to the service of idol worship I might have said let us cast a stone after the fallen therefore it is said after that he is sold he shall be redeemed one of his brethren shall redeem him but perhaps he shall be redeemed means he shall not be absorbed by the idolaters but as far as redemption is concerned we should indeed deal stringently with him said Arnaman B. Isaac it is written if there be yet increases in the years and if there remain but little in the years are there. Then prolonged years and shortened years, but the meaning is this if his value increased and his redemption shall be paid out of the money that he was bought for, and if his value decreased, the basis of the redemption shall be according unto his remaining years. But perhaps the meaning is this if he served two years with four remaining, let him repay him for four years out of the money that he was bought for, while if he served four years with two remaining, let him repay two years. According unto his years, if that were the meaning, let scripture write, if there be a many years, why in years he should name it means if his value increased in these years, then his redemption shall be paid out of the money that he was bought for, and if his value decreased in these years, the basis of the redemption shall be according unto his remaining years. Our Joseph said, Arnaman interpreted these verses with authority as of Sinai, he may not sell a distant field, etc. Whence? Do we know these things for our rabbis taught and his hand shall reach i.e. his own hand implying that he must not borrow to redeem and find excludes that which he possessed already he must not sell a remote field to redeem a nearer one nor a bad one to redeem a good one sufficient means to redeem it i.e. he may redeem it wholly but not by half shall we say that the phrase and he find means that which is here already against this I will raise a contradiction and find it that excludes it. Case where he the victim brought himself within the range of the missile hence our Eliezer said if after the stone had left his hand the other put out his head and received it the blow he the former is free this shows that he find refers to something that had been here already before Robert replied here in our case we consider the context of scripture and there too we consider the context of scripture here it corresponds to and his hand reaches just as his hand reaches means only. Now thus also and find means just now and there too and find it corresponds to the forest just as the forest was here before so does and find it means that he the neighbor was here already before in the case of objects consecrated etc. Whence do we know these things because our rabbis taught and if he that sanctified the field will indeed redeem it that teaches that he can borrow and redeem and redeem by have said our simian what is the reason because we find in the case of one who sells a field of possession that since his privilege is strengthened and that if the jubilee arrives and it has not been redeemed it reverts to the owner his rights are weakened in so far that he cannot borrow and redeem or redeem by have whereas he who consecrates a field of possession since his rights are weakened and that if the jubilee comes and it is not redeemed it goes out to the priests therefore his privilege is strengthened in so far that he may borrow and redeem as well as redeem by Hafs Talmud, Masarak in a one buried the taught he may not borrow and redeem and may not redeem by Hafs this is no difficulty one is in accord with the rabbis the other with our Simeon Mishnah if one sold a house among the houses in a walled city he may redeem it at once and at any time during twelve months it is a kind of receiving interest and yet not interest if the seller died his son may redeem it if the purchaser died it may be redeemed from his son one can reckon the year only. From the time that he sold it as it is said within the space of a year since it says a full year the intercalary month is included therein rabbi says he is allowed a year and its intercalary days if the last day of the twelve months has arrived and it was not redeemed it becomes his abiding possession no matter whether he bought it or received it as a gift as it is said in perpetuity Gamara our Mishnah will not be in accord with rabbi for it was taught rabbi said Yom days that means no less than two days how do the rabbis explain yamam they need it for the indication from the day to the day and whence does rabbi know the rule from the day to the day he derives it from within a whole year after it is sold and the rabbis this verse is needed to teach that one considers only the year after his sale and not the universal calendar year and the word yamam indicates that 24 astronomical hours are meant for if we had only within a whole year after it is sold to go by one might have assumed that it must be a full year from day to day but need not be from exact hour to exact hour therefore the divine lord yamam whence does rabbi know that it must be from hour to hour he derives that from full year and the rabbis that is necessary for the inclusion of its intercalary days but rabbi too requires that for its intercalary days that indeed is so but that the year must be full from day to day and from hour to hour he derives from within a whole year after it is sold, it is a kind of interest, etc. But was it not taught this is real interest, except that the Torah has permitted it in this case? Our Yohan and said this is no difficulty. One teaching is in accord with our Judah, the other with the sages, for it was taught if one had a creditor's claim of one main against his neighbor and the latter pledged unto him the sale of his field, and if the seller has the usufruct, it is permitted. But if the purchaser has it, usufruct, it is forbidden. Our Judah says even if the purchaser has the usufruct, it is permitted. Said our Judah, it happened with both Bezun, and that with the approval of our Eliezer Bezer Yah, he pledged his field sale, and the purchaser had the usufruct. They said to him, would you this evidence from there? The seller had the usufruct, not the purchaser. Wherein do they differ? They differ with respect to one-sided usury. The first tana holds one-sided usury to be forbidden, whilst our Judah is a bit. Opinion that one-sided usury is permitted Talmud, Masarak and B. Rabbah said all agree that one-sided usury is forbidden here they are disputing the principle of usury received on condition that it shall be returned one holding it to be forbidden the other to be permitted if the seller died his son may redeem it but that is self-evident you might have said the divine law said and if a man sell a dwelling house and this one the son did not sell it therefore we are informed that he may redeem it which means anyway if the purchaser died it may be redeemed from the hand of his son but that is self-evident you might have said the divine law said to him that bought it but this one did not buy it therefore we are informed and he may redeem it which means anyway one can reckon the year only from the time that he sold it etc our rabbis taught it is written here I would not know whether this year is to be counted to the first or the second purchaser but as it says with it Space of a full year it must mean to the first whose abiding possession does it become our Eliezer said it becomes the abiding possession of the first one our Yohanan said it becomes the abiding possession of the second this is quite right according to our Eliezer since we reckon also according to him but what is the reason for our Yohanan's view our Abba B. Memel said what did the first sell to the second all the rights that may accrue to him therefom our Abba B. Memel said if one sold two houses in a walled city one on the fifteenth day of the first Adar and the other on the first day of the second Adar then as soon as the first day of Adar in the next year has arrived the year is complete for the sale of the first day of the second Adar but for the sale of the fifteenth of Adar the year does not become complete before the fifteenth Adar in the next year Robin but could he not say unto him I lighted a fire before you that would not be effective because he could re
Zamithyuth, i.e. permanently another explanation la that includes a gift what is the reason since instead of Zamith it says Zamithyuth the scholar said before our Papa according to whom is this evidently not in accord with our Meir for if according to our Meir surely he said a gift is not treated like a sale our Papa answered you may even say that it is in accord with our Meir but here it is different because the divine law in saying la has included the field by gift it. Scholar said to our Papa or as some say Arhuna the son of our Joshua said to our Papa but in connection with the Jubilee touching which it is said Yeshel return includes a gift yet our Meir does not include a gift hence indeed it is not in accord with our Meir our rabbis taught if one consecrated a house among the houses in a walled city he may redeem it at once and redeem it any time in the future if someone else redeemed it from the sanctuary and the last day of the twelve months has arrived. And the original owner did not redeem it from him who redeemed it then it is his in perpetuity once do we know this said Samuel because scripture said to him that bought it i.e. even out of the possession of the sanctuary but let it become the permanent possession of the sanctuary scripture said throughout his generations that excludes the sanctuary which has no generations why is it written it shall not go out in the Jubilee said our Saffir that was necessary only for the case of one who Sold a house among the houses in a walled city and the jubilee arrived within the first year one might have assumed it shall go out on the jubilee therefore we were taught it shall not go out in the jubilee mission before time he the buyer used to hide himself on the last day of the twelve months so that the house might become his permanent possession but Hillel ordained that he that sold it could deposit his money in a chamber and break down the door and enter and that the other whenever he wanted might come and take his money Gamara Rabbah said one may deduce from the ordinance of Hillel that if a husband said to his wife here is thy bill of divorce on condition that you give me two hundred zoos and she gave it to him and she is divorced if she did so with his consent but if against his will she is not divorced Talmud, Masarakana for since it was necessary for Hillel to ordain that in this case giving against the recipient's will is considered valid giving. The inference is that elsewhere such giving is not considered valid giving to this our Papa or as others say our Shimai be Ashi demurred but perhaps Hillel had to ordain this only in his absence but in his presence it would be considered a valid gift both with his consent or without it others reported Rabbah said from the ordinance of Hillel one can infer that if a husband said here is your bill of divorce on condition that you give me two hundred zoos and she thereupon gave them to him whether that was given with his consent or against his will it is a valid gift for Hillel's ordinance was necessary in the case of the recipient's absence but where he was present whether given with his consent or against his will the gift is valid to this our Papa or as some say our Shimai be Ashi demurred but perhaps whether it was in his presence or absence it is valid only if it was given with his consent but not if without his consent and as to Hillel he ordained what was required by the circumstances. Of the case Mishnah whatsoever is within the city wall is regarded as the dwelling houses in a walled city with the exception of fields our Meir says also fields if a house is built into the wall our Judah says it is not considered a house within a walled city our Simeon says its outer wall is regarded as its city wall Gemara our rabbis taught it is written house hence I know only about a house whence do I learn to include the building for the oil press bath houses towers dovecoats pits trenches and caves therefore the text states that is in the city one might have assumed that fields are also included therefore it is said house so our Judah our Meir says house hence I know only about a house whence do I learn to include the buildings for the oil press bath houses towers dovecoats pits trenches and caves and also fields therefore the text states that is in the city but surely it is written house our Hista in the name of our said the practical difference between them. Applies in the case of a sand mount and a glen. Thus also was it taught concerning a sand mount and a glen. Our Meir said they are as houses are Judah. They are as fields if a house is built into the wall. Our Judah says it is not considered a house within the walled city, etc. Our Yohanan said and both expound the same scriptural verse. Then she let them down by a cord through the window for her house was upon the side of the wall and she dwelt upon the wall. Our Simeon explains it according to the simple meaning of the text. Whilst our Judah holds she dwelt upon the wall, not in a walled city. Mission a house within a city whose house roofs form its wall or that was not encompassed by a wall in the days of Joshua. Be none is not considered a dwelling house in a walled city. A house in any of the following is accounted a house in a walled city. Those in a city of no less than three courtyards having two houses each which have been encompassed by a wall in the days of Joshua. Be none such as the old. Castle of Sepphoris, the fort of Geshelab, Old Yod, Pakamal, Gadad, Hadid, Ono, Jerusalem, and the like. Gemara, our rabbis taught it is written a wall, but not a line formed by joining roofs round about that excludes Tiberias, whose wall is the lake. Our Elizer B. Jose says Asher Lohoma, even though it has none now, as long as it had one before a house in any of the following is accounted in walled cities, etc. It was taught Gamal was in Galilee, Gadad, in Transjordania, Hadid, Ono, and Jerusalem, in Judea. What does he mean to say Talmud, Masarak, and Bia? They said this is what he means all the cities up to Gamal in Galilee, up to Gadad, in Transjordania, and Hadid, Ono, and Jerusalem, in Judea. Rabbis said Gamal in Galilee is mentioned so as to exclude any city called Gamal in other countries, Gadad, in Transjordania, to exclude Gadad in any other countries, but with regard to the other, since there are none of the same name like them, no statement as to their location was necessary, but is any. House in Jerusalem liable to become irredeemable was it not taught ten special regulations were applied to Jerusalem first that a house sold there should not be liable to become irredeemable etc. Our Yohanan said the Mishnah means like Jerusalem that was encompassed by a wall in the days of Joshua be none yet not like Jerusalem for in Jerusalem no house sold there was liable to become irredeemable but here a house sold is liable to become irredeemable our Ashi said did not our Joseph say there were two different cities called Kadesh thus also were there two cities called Jerusalem it was taught our Ishmael be Jose said why did the sages enumerate those in the Mishnah because when the exiles from Babylon went up to Palestine they found these cities and sanctified them but former cities lost their holiness as the sanctity of the land was lost he holds therefore that as to the first consecration he consecrated it only for the time being but not for the future I will raise a Question of contradiction against this Arishmael B. Jose said were there only these mentioned in the Mishnah surely it has been said three score cities all the region of Argob all these were fortified cities why then did the sages enumerate but these because when the exiles came up they found these and consecrated them anew and consecrated them surely we said above that it was not necessary to consecrate them anew rather read they found those and enumerated them and not only these are walled cities but anyone concerning which you have a tradition from your fathers that it was encompassed by a wall since the days of Joshua be none then all these laws apply to it because as to the first consecration he consecrated it not only for the time being but for the future if you like say there were two tanaim in conflict about the view of Arishmael or if you like say one of them was our Eliezer B. Jose for it was taught our Eliezer B. Jose said Asher Lohoma even though it is not Encompassed by one today as long as it was walled before what is the reason of the one who holds as to the first consecration he consecrated it only for the time being but not for the future because it is written and all the congregation of them that were come back out of the captivity made booths and dwelt in the booths for since the days of Joshua the son of Nun had not the children of Israel done so and there was very great gladness is it possible that when David came they made no booths. When Solomon came they did not make booths until Ezra came rather he compares their arrival in the days of Ezra to their arrival in the days of Joshua just as at their arrival in the days of Joshua they counted the years of release and the jubilees and consecrated cities encompassed by walls thus also at their arrival in the days of Ezra they counted the years of release and the jubilees and consecrated walled cities and it says also and the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy Fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it thus comparing your possession thereof with that of your fathers just as your forefathers possession thereof brought about a renewal of all these things so shall your possession thereof bring about a renewal of all these things and the other he Ezra had prayed for mercy because of the passion for idolatry and he removed it and his merit then shielded them even as the booth that is why scripture reproved Joshua for in all other passages it is spelt. Joshua but here Joshua it was quite right that Moses did not pray for mercy because the virtue power of the holy land was absent to support his plea but why
Naman B. Isaac they counted the jubilees to keep the years of release holy Talmud, Masa reckoned that that will be right in the view of the rabbis who hold that the 50th year is not included but according to our Judah who holds that the 50th year counts both ways why was it necessary to count the jubilees it would have been enough if the years of release alone had been counted hence we must say this is not in accord with the view of our Judah but did they not count years of release and the jubilees is it not written at the end of seven years ye shall let go every man his brother that is a Hebrew that hath been sold unto thee and when we ask why at the end of seven years is it not written he shall serve thee six years and to this our Naman B. Isaac replied six for one who had been sold and seven for one who had his ear pierced this is written in connection with the threat of punishment for the prophet said did you set them free when you should have done so but it is said they hear Kent and let them go rather said our Yohan and Jeremiah brought them back and Josiah son of Ammon ruled over them once do we know that they returned because it is written for the seller shall not return to that which is sold now is it possible that the jubilee was abolished already and the prophet would prophesy concerning it that it will be abolished this therefore teaches that Jeremiah had brought them back once do we know that Josiah ruled over them because it is written and he said what monument is that which I see and the men of the city told him it is the sepulchre of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel now what had Josiah to do at Bethel hence we must say when Jeremiah had brought them back Josiah ruled over them Arnon and B. Isaac derived it from here also O Judah there is a harvest catcher appointed for the mission houses in courtyards have the privileges both of houses in a wall City and the privileges given to fields they can be redeemed at once and at any time within the twelve months like houses in a walled city and they go out to the owners in the year of jubilee or at an earlier time by payment of a lesson price like fields Kamara our rabbis taught it is written but the houses in courtyards which have no wall about them shall be reckoned with the fields of the country scripture compares them with a field of possession just as a field of possession goes out in the jubilee and by payment of a lesson price so do houses in courtyards go out in the year of jubilee and by payment of a lesson price one might have assumed that similarly just as a field of possession may not be redeemed before two years thus may houses in courtyards not be redeemed before two years therefore it is said they may be redeemed i.e. at once since you have given them the privileges of fields as well as those of houses in walled cities one might assume that they do not go out in the year of jubilee therefore it is said and they shall go out in the jubilee what does he mean to say said Arunah this was necessary to be stated only for the case of one who consecrates a house among the houses in the courtyard and someone else redeemed it from the sanctuary and the year of jubilee came in its second year with what now will you compare it if you compare it to a house in a walled city it becomes the perpetual possession of the purchaser if you compare it to a field of possession it goes out to the priests for this case it was necessary to say and they shall go out in the jubilee to this rzeira demurred why speak about someone else redeeming it even if no one redeemed it the same law would apply said Abbe, this is not so less people say consecrated property goes out without redemption once do we know that it is derived from a levite if a levite whose privilege is strengthened where he sold property has his rights weakened where he Consecrated an object how much more shall an Israelite whose rights are weakened where he sold property have his rights weakened with regard to an object which he consecrated himself and whence do we know it there because it was taught and if a man purchase of the Levites then shall go out in the jubilee that which was sold from this I might infer that the law applies even to his slaves his movable property and his documents therefore it is said of a house in the city of his possession. What then does that which was sold mean what he sold goes out without payment but no consecrated object goes out without payment but requires redemption now this conflicts with our Ashai for our Ashai said all was included in the general statement then shall he add the fifth part of the money and it shall be assured to him and when scripture specified with regard to the field of possession but the field when it goeth out in the jubilee shall be holy unto the Lord as a field devoted it. Teaches only a field if redeemed goes out from the one who redeemed it to the priests, but all other objects redeemed from the sanctuary remain where they are. For what purpose then is it said? And they shall go out in the jubilee. Our papa said this is necessary, but for the case of one who sells a house among the houses in courtyards, and the jubilee came in the second year. With what now will you compare it? If you compare it to a house in a walled city, it becomes the perpetual possession of the purchaser. If you compare it to a field of possession, it needs the completion of two years in the purchaser's possession. For this case, it was necessary to state, and they shall go out in the jubilee. It was taught in accord with our and in refutation of our Ashai. If one consecrates a house among the houses in courtyards, then he may redeem it at once and redeem it forever. If someone else redeemed it from the sanctuary and the jubilee arrived and it had not been redeemed by the original. Owner it reverts in the year of Jubilee to the owner Talmud, Masarak and Bimisha the following are considered houses in open courtyards a city in which are two courtyards each having two houses even though they have been encompassed by a wall since the days of Joshua be none are they counted houses in open courtyards Gemara are rabbis taught by mere implication of the text houses of the courtyards would I not know that they are not encompassed by walls why then is it stated which have no wall around them to teach us that even if they were encompassed by a wall they would still be considered as not being so encompassed and how many houses and courtyards must there be houses denotes two courtyards also two i.e. two courtyards having two houses each but perhaps one house in one courtyard then the divine law should have written only courtyards and if you were to say if the divine law had written only courtyards it would have been understood as a courtyard without a house. But such a one is called an enclosure and not a courtyard mission. If an Israelite inherited a house in a walled city of the Levites from his mother's father who was a Levite, he cannot redeem it according to the order here prescribed. Also, if a Levite inherited a house in a walled city of Israelites from his mother's father who was an Israelite, he cannot redeem it according to the order here prescribed as it is written for the houses of the cities of the Levites. Else, this order thus does not apply unless he is a Levite. And in the cities of the Levites, these are the words of Rabbi the sages say these things apply only to the cities of the Levites. Gemara, then like whom does he redeem like a Levite? But then it teaches unless he is a Levite. And in the cities of the Levites, say he cannot redeem it except they see according to the foregoing order here prescribed unless he is a Levite. And in the cities of the Levites, these are the words of Rabbi. It is quite right as to unless he is in it. Cities of the Levites as it is written for the houses of the Levites but once do we know that these foregoing rules do not apply unless he is a Levite because it was written and if a man redeem of the Levites it was likewise taught and if a man redeem repurchases of the Levites one might assume that a Levite could repurchase from an Israelite because the privileges of the former are strengthened whereas the rights of the latter are weakened but a Levite could not repurchase from a Levite because the privileges of both are strengthened therefore it is said and if a man redeem of the Levites of the Levites i.e. but not all the Levites excluding a Levite who is a bastard or a Nathan the sages however say these things apply only to the cities of the Levites but we do not say that he must be a Levite mission one may not turn a field into a city's outskirts nor a city's outskirts into a field nor a city's outskirts into a city nor a city into a city's outskirts our Eliezer said this applies only to the cities of the Levites, but in the cities of the Israelites, one may turn a field into a city's outskirts, but not a city's outskirts into a field. One may turn a city's outskirts into a city, but not a city into a city's outskirts. That they destroy not the cities of Israel. The priests and Levites may sell a house at any time and redeem it at any time, as it is said. The Levites shall have a perpetual right of redemption. Gemara R. Eliezer said this applies only to the cities of the Levites, but in the cities of the Israelites, one may turn, etc. But at any rate, all are of the opinion that in the cities of the Levites, one may not effect any change. Once do we know that R. Eliezer said because Scripture said, but the fields of the open land about their cities may not be sold. What does may not be sold mean? Shall I say that it may not be sold at all? But since it is written, the Levites shall have a perpetual right of redemption. It is evident that they must be selling. Rather must may not be sold mean that they may not be changed as above the priests and Levites may sell at any time and redeem at any time our rabbis taught the Levites shall have a perpetual right of redemption what does that teach us because it is said according unto the number of years of the crops he shall sell unto thee one might have assumed that shall apply also here therefore it is said the Levites shall have a perpetual right of redemption
interpreted it before our Papa we suppose that they the cities had fallen to them the Levites together with their outskirts Talmud, Masarak and Talmud, Masarak but they as well as their outskirts are to be torn down our Ashi said it is necessary to teach the law for one might have assumed that before they are torn down if any of the houses therein have been sold they should become perpetual possessions therefore we are informed that is not so our rabbis taught as a field. Devoted the possession thereof shall be the priests. What does that teach? Once do we know that if a priest consecrated a field obtained by him as a field of devotion that he cannot say since it anyway goes out to the priests in the jubilee year and now is in my possession it shall be my own a fortiori if I acquire title to what belongs to others how much more can I acquire title to what belongs to me therefore it is said as a field devoted the possession thereof shall be to the priest. Now what are we learning from the words as a field devoted behold the text came to teach and now it itself is illuminated thereby we compare the field acquired by the priest as a field of devotion to an Israelite's field of possession just as an Israelite's field of possession goes out of his hand and is distributed among the priests so also does the field which he acquired as a field of devotion go out of his hand to be distributed among his brethren the priests the master said if I Acquire title to what belonged to others, but how can that be compared there? He simply acquires title to it, but here he takes himself from me. Behama said it is necessary to state that you might have assumed since it is written, and every man's hallowed things shall be as that this also is like his hallowed things, but how can you compare these? His hallowed things are not in his possession, whereas this is in his possession, rather said our nom, and it is necessary to teach this for you might have. Assumed since it is written, for that is their perpetual possession, that this too is his possession, therefore the text his possession informs us that the law applies only to his possession, but not to anything obtained by him as devotion.